All right, I'm sitting here with Josh Deck today. How are you doing, Josh? It's a good day today. Is it? It's like minus 30 and the snow crunches under my feet like glass. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, I hate it. You like <laughs> in the chairs? I do, yeah. I've uh, said before when I came in, they feel a little bit porny. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it does the job. I feel cozy. One of my friends had mentioned that, um, <clears throat> A, she's like, are you okay with me uh, like picking my legs up and everything and putting, because that's what I'm going to do. And I said, yep. I said, the more comfortable yeah. you are, I think the better it'll be. Um, she's like, the only thing is, though, is it might look like a therapy session. <laughs> and I was like, eh, I'm sure. I'll start won't. hugging the pillow. Right? <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll get over that, right? I'll put my legs up, maybe spread them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, open it up a bit. Get in the mood of the chair. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Josh. Well, how about you uh, start off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Wow, where to start? Um, you know the Dos Equis guy who's like the most interesting man in the world? Yeah, it's that beer, right? Yeah. Is yeah. there an opposite of that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there is, yeah. Yeah, so I'm that guy. So yeah, man, my name's Josh. I used to be a paramedic. I went from paramedics to personal training, and now I'm a holistic nutritionist, and I specialize in things like ulcerative colitis and other IBD diseases like Crohn's, and it's been an awesome ride. And that is like the summary of my life right there. All right. Well, we're going to have to dive deep into that. So there's a lot to dive in. I, okay. So like, I'm like, we, we were talking about this before the podcast that, um, like the, one of the reasons I wanted to do this was not necessarily like you mentioned the word revenue aspect or whatever. Sure. It's just, I just want to have a conversation with people. Um, I want to get to know people more because learning people helps me be not, never mind better at my job but just better at life in general and understanding sure. individuals and stuff. And so um, obviously being in the same industry mm -hmm. and pra like practicing the same kind of modalities and such, um, obviously my interest is there to have you on as a guest, but I'm very curious about the transitioning mm -hmm. of a paramedic and like the history of a paramedic and how it's like, you know, come into who you are today because I don't know many paramedics. I've worked with a few mm -hmm. uh, and working with them was very, very difficult, uh, very busy schedules and whatnot uh, and just stress levels. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think people who have not been in that position like understand how difficult it could be on you, on like one's yeah. soul, if that, right? And so when, what was the, what, what initially drove you into becoming a paramedic? You know what? It's, it's funny you ask that question because a lot of people say, well, I really wanted to help people. And I'm really big on going through the hard psychology stuff. I love psychoanalysis. I love learning about myself and others and like the real root reasons. We can always say why we do stuff. Like why do, why does somebody want to lose weight? Well, I just want to, I want to feel good. Well, what do you want to feel good? Really? It comes down to, I want to look good naked and not scream at myself in the mirror, right? Like there's really deep root causes. And so I realized I became a paramedic. I wanted to help people. But for me, I'll dive way, like way back to it. I was a middle child, right? I was, I was number three out of four until my mom had a fifth with, her, with my stepdad now. So I'm middle of five boys growing up in a home. All, even, even your step sibling? Your so boy? let's back it up one <laughs> further. We need our own HBO TV show telling <laughs> you, or HGTV. So we've got my four brothers, right? Were Jeff, Joel, Josh, John. <laughs> my mom got remarried. He had two stepsons. I know this. I, I know you know I this. Know this. <laughs> so he had two stepsons, Justin and Jeremy. I, I worked with Josh's <clears throat> mother. So. Yes, you did. Yeah, that's right. So that's how it's all coming back to me now. My apologies. Anyways, continue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. So we got Jeff, Joel, Josh, John. My mom got remarried. He already had two boys, Justin and Jeremy. They had a son, Jordan. My dad is Jamie. My grandpa was Jacob. It's just like Jeff, Joel, Josh, John, Jordan, Justin, Jeremy, Jamie, Jacob. Nice. Right? <laughs> I've done that lots of times before. And so growing up in this household, for me, really becoming a paramedic, I love doing it. I love saving and helping people. Right? But I also had kind of a savior complex a little bit, which okay. wasn't healthy to have. And I also- Would you say it fuels an ego or was it- Oh, it Was did. it help bring you out of an insecurity? I liked feeling important. Okay. I-, I I really genuinely love working with people and helping people. There's always something in the back there where I like to feel important. And it's something I've identified in my behavior patterns. Okay. So on a psychology level, it's allowed me to actually, and people say, well, you know, I'm not like that. We need to know our roots, man, because on a relationship level, on a personal level, on a psychological level, it's really allowed me to level myself and balance out why I do certain things and do things that truly bring me fulfillment, not fill a void. There's a big difference between filling a void and being fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm doing now. So, so, oh, so like, so there. coming out of paramedic to personal <clears throat> training and then holistic, that's, you feel like you're fulfilling now. 
Yes. I feel more fulfilled than filling. So paramedic was just kind of like, what was the word you used? Filling the void? It wasn't yeah. the actual fulfillment. I enjoyed it. But yes, I'd say it filled a void. You get in there, you're in uniform, you go to Tim Hortons, they give you free coffee. For our US listeners, Tim Hortons is just a Canadian <laughs> mainstay. It's been around longer than I have. Yeah. And so, yeah, you get free coffee. People always want to talk to you. And uh, you get the old ladies in there, like in their 80s, like, I think I need CPR. You're like, mouth to mouth, you dirty girl. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, there was an attention aspect of it. There was a yeah, level of okay. importance. People would respect you and look at you mm. differently. Now working in an industry, especially in something like, I like specifically work with ulcerative colitis. And it's an industry where, as you know, the Western medical world has everyone conditioned that we are, the body makes mistakes. It has to be patched with drugs. There's nothing we can do about it. Ulcerative colitis is autoimmune. Take the drugs five, eight, 10 years. We'll cut out your colon and that's it. It doesn't have to be that way. As you know, as I know, we're showing it dozens, but I have an entire, a growing industry, millions of people, okay, dealing with ulcerative colitis, but they're all conditioned to believe it's autoimmune and that I'm a liar and I get hated. I got flamed on Reddit. I got spammed. I had, yeah, you're really big <clears throat> into the whole forums, like, or what would you call it? Like, just well, somebody actually blasted me on Reddit for my Facebook page. I'm really right. active on Facebook. Yeah, super inactive on Instagram. Recently had a viral video on TikTok. It's like six hundred thousand views. About that yeah. After, yeah, and so all, all kinds in there. But somebody took one of my Facebook posts, blasted it on Reddit, and just flamed me for it. Like, can't believe the ignorance on this. Blah blah what blah. What was the post? The post says, "I firmly believe nine out of ten cases of ulcerative colitis can be reversed." which is completely accurate. In fact, right now, with just diet, nutrition, lifestyle supplementation, 92% going through our program so far, I did the numbers. The other 8% require a GI map or something a bit more, like a bit more integrative, like you and I have worked on together. And so <clears throat> it's been a very interesting transition and process trying to change the paradigm of an entire growing industry. And as one quick segue, I'll tell you, I'm big, I'm big on numbers and, and Statistics. I feel like Jim Carrey, just the statistics. So the statistics you can say all on the J's it. in your family. <laughs> I can't say <laughs> statistics. <clears throat> and so ulcerative colitis, right? Diagnosis of ulcerative colitis globally, according to the CDC, there's a little over six million cases around the world. Okay. The United States of America is about 360 million people. They are less than one twentieth of the world's population but they have 50% of the ulcerative colitis cases. The U.S. does. The U.S. does. 50%, being less than 5% of the world, they have 50% of the issues. That's a problem. It's not autoimmune. It's not genetic. It's not a thing. It's something about our food and our system, which will bring us back to that TikTok video I posted. Mm -hmm. So would you say, um, <clears throat> like we're going to come back to a lot of this, uh, but just out of curiosity, would you say that's where most of your <clears throat> clientele is from? <clears throat> uh, like we were talking about demograph before. So the States? Yes, I'd say primarily. Um, I'm probably 90, 95% in the States. I have a couple people here and there in Canada and Europe, but the Europeans... They do a lot better with their gut. I was going to say, you don't really need to order gut issues. <laughs> no, not over there. <laughs> I've literally uh, got people commenting on my videos. Again, that TikTok that I posted, they're going in there talking about how they moved to the States and within months, their gut was a mess. They left and their gut was fixed again. Okay. So we'll talk about the TikTok right here, right now. Sure. But I want to say uh, for actually go into it actually, because I'll explain to you like, because sure. the fact that I'll, I'll say before is that the States is bad. Canada's worse. Which is not an exciting piece of news, that I want to be here. <laughs> right? <laughs> but, but uh, yeah. So like recently, because that was what it was five hundred thousand views, was it? Uh, yeah, it's up to five hundred and fifty-seven thousand or something. Yeah, it's a lot of views, man. <laughs> yeah, considering my other ones are like four hundred to a thousand. I know right? it's it's crazy because like if you let's use the word research, if you research into like social media content and and like how to you know expand upon that and mm -hmm. whatnot uh they a lot of people will say it just takes one viral video yeah like you'll have like a bunch that are hit like it's like obviously not even remotely close but i have one youtube video that shot up overnight over 200 something views mm -hmm. right and like for the like we were just talking about this prior to the podcast like for a little guy that's pretty good for me like I, that made for me being the first video 200 organic views is great right and so like you know not that that's my viral <clears throat> thing but it's like all it takes is just mm -hmm. one and like it could happen overnight kind of thing right so okay so go ahead and let's explain what was the tiktok sure so the tiktok video was american health foods that are banned in other countries 
And so we're talking, there's basics, we went over things like chicken, went over pork, ground beef, and other meats, right? And so you look at chicken in the US, it's banned by the European Union and some other countries, a lot of Scandinavia, because the US will wash their chicken in chlorine. Now the EU is like, you know, it's just a little bit of chlorine, whatever, they have it in pools, it's kind of whatever. But the reason that they want to ban it is they question the practices in the food production practices that require you to detoxify your chicken and your meats by washing it in chlorine. And this is Europe? Yes. Okay. So they're they're contesting it. They're contesting it. Okay. Uh, pork, for example. Uh, I can't. Don't quote me on this, but I believe it's banned by Russia, China, European Union, Japan, uh, probably Australia, Hungary, a couple of those countries. Australia, New Zealand ban a lot of shit. Well, pork, pork even mm -hmm. away from that is pork tends to be higher in bacteria, mm -hmm. higher in bacteria, higher in nitrates, higher in histamine. So pork is all, like, let's say it was the most healthy, clean process. True. I still would be like, yeah, let's limit your pork intake. Yeah because of what it contains, but sorry, go on. Yeah, no, you're right. So pork, they ban it because there's a chemical substance used in the feed called ractopamine. Now, ractopamine, it's used to bulk and lean. It's basically steroids for pigs, right? Bulks them up, leans them out, so they, they're worth more at the, on scale. And so they get there. The problem with ractopamine is that it's, it's a chemical that's known. It's directly linked to cancer and all kinds of inflammatory conditions. It's banned in over 160 countries, but somewhere around eight to 12% of the US still uses it in the feed and it's still allowed. And that's why it's banned. They don't trust it. And when Russia and China ban your food, you got something to think about. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think it's interesting because like, I remember I've always mentioned that I would like to end up in the States because mm -hmm. while well, you even say yourself, like you have a high, very high percentage of your clientele is from the States. Uh, but there's just like, I think in our industry, there is better opportunity there. Um, now one of that, reasons being it could be the lack of regulations mm -hmm. um because i know like i remember i went into a supplement store one time and i was having a conversation with them and i had mentioned that i'm waiting for some supplements to come from my u.s hookup like as a joke it's yeah. just a you know a friend who's sending them uh just because they don't have an npn number so they don't have that mm -hmm. french label so they're not allowing them across the border which is um interesting to say the least i don't know what the theory behind that is but anyways silly af <laughs> yeah and so she like instantly scoffed at me and was like <laughs> implying yeah like there's gonna be a bunch of bad stuff in there i said well no i said this isn't just random crap like this is some of the world's leaders like biobotanical sure, i whatnot. understand where she's maybe coming from in ignorance that the u.s has some regulations to put all kinds of junk in their junk yeah and i 100 percent and that so i didn't like fault her by any means sure. i just corrected her and i was like look i said this is actually like these are what i'm getting and the mm -hmm. next thing you know like 20 minutes in the conversation she was writing them all down and, <laughs> and everything and whatnot Educate so, is important <laughs> <laughs> but that's exactly it is is they regulate a lot less mm. they don't um like you can get away with a lot more and i'm not big on politics by any means mm -hmm. so like if you were to ever ask me like what does the u.s allow or like i have no idea like at the end of the day so what was the word you use that they put in pigs ractopamine ractopamine so like I've never even heard the word ractopamine, right? And yeah. then people be like, okay, well, you know, is it lacking education and stuff? At the end of the day, where I'm at in my career, it doesn't matter if it's ractopamine, it doesn't matter if it was cigarettes, it doesn't matter if mm -hmm. it was processed foods. I'm looking at, okay, like, yeah, okay, we need maybe need to avoid that chemical if it's highly found in pigs. I don't promote pork anyways, mm -hmm. um, but like, if it's from cigarettes. I'm not sure. worried about what chemical is in there. Stay away from the cigarette, <laughs> right? Like there's nothing good about cigarettes. Yeah. And yeah. so what my main focus though is like, okay, let's say it did cause cancer. I'm focused on the cancer itself. Now, right. yes, focusing on that is elimination, right? And so, yeah, maybe I do need to educate myself much more, but at the end of the day, like you use, use chicken, for example, yeah. I really try not to give people chicken. I, I, I rarely, rarely put chicken in my programs. I don't think it's a good protein source. It can cause digestive distress, uh, but it is a staple because it is cheap. It is high in protein. It's just compared to other sources like, you know, grass fed, grass finished beef and wild salmon and wild cod and everything They're They have a much higher uh, nutrient dense value True. compared to something like chicken, but wild fish is cha-ching. You know what I mean? Grass fed, grass finished is to ching, like it's expensive stuff. Yeah. So I'm way fancier than my income allows me to be. 100%, <laughs> right? And so that is why, like, I can't eat chicken. Yeah. I'm like, I took a MRT test, which is a media release test. So it tells you kind of like what your immune system's responding to. Sure. Much, much, much more advanced than an allergy test. Like, never take an allergy test. It's just a waste mm -hmm. of time. 
Um, like you're saying IgG. allergy test. You mean, oh, you mean IgG test? Yeah, yeah, like they're just a waste of time. So you want to take like an immediate release test. Now, once again, they're pretty expensive. But anyways, my chicken came up real high. And I always knew I had an intolerance to chicken. Um, but a funny note on that is I could go somewhere like a fast food joint and order chicken strips and they won't affect me. <laughs> so I was going, like, mm. wonder. <laughs> yeah, what's in your sawdust? Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting that I think it's, I think it's great of you to be educated in that aspect of knowing what chemicals are in foods to help educate people because this has just been stuck in my mind. And we hear this a lot. A lot of us say this, that pharmaceutical industry wants you to be sick because they make more money. And I don't often said that. like, I don't fully agree with that. I understand that. Yeah. A like, patient cured is a customer lost. Really true. Right. But the thing is, is uh, there's so much lack of education out there. So it's the same thing around the whole, um, we're not going to say the word, but you know, the, the, um, the yeah. recent events and, the, and the, <laughs> everybody was, was, was ripping into that Alberta doctor. And I said, I was like, you know what? Maybe she truly believes deep down in her heart that this is helping, right? Like if you think about how many people are in Alberta, 30 million plus? Canada's 35 million. Oh, okay. <laughs> so God don't it. It. <laughs> <laughs> I want to edit that out. Um, anyways, there's a lot of people in Alberta, let's say. Yeah. That's a lot of people you're responsible responsible for that's a lot of stress on an individual and so maybe she thought she was making the right decisions now in no way shape or form am i saying that you know they don't want you sick i just think it's like an extreme approach <clears throat> and there's just lack of education for example the ulcerative colitis mm. and thinking that it's not manageable or possibility of remission and such right yeah. um because we're not educated in that aspect. It's it's funny you, you go down that road because I am very much like the government's out to get us. It's all a big conspiracy. I'm the one who like the world's going to collapse. Now, that being said, over the last two and a half years, I have yet to be wrong about a single thing. Yeah, no, I don't negate so. it at all. I don't <laughs> negate it at all. I just believe that the, the point would be that sometimes people truly believe what they're doing is right. Sure. They Absolutely. truly believe what they're when doing is right. Under duress as well, man. That's yeah. Like, and that's exactly it too. Like, like the whole jab situation recently. Yep. I truly <laughs> believe like I have my stance on things, but I don't negate other people's because if they truly believe in their heart that this is what's going to better themselves and the people around them, then all the power to them. When it, yeah, until I, they start, you know, like let's say when it becomes faulting imposed. you or imposing, yeah, then I understand that. Um, but I think if we were just educated more, and so like sometimes I will get frustrated, and if somebody tries to say something, I'll be that let's just use the word douchebag who throws out big fancy words. So if you mm -hmm. can't tell me what these are and what they mean and what their mechanisms are, I feel like you shouldn't be talking on this subject until you educate yourself. There's a certain threshold that of, of aptitude that you need to hit before you can actually have what I would consider as an expert in my field to be a valid opinion. Right. And, yeah. and impose it on <laughs> other people. Right. Right. And then so like, but then you get the rebuttalment of, okay, well scientists, right like education is within a textbook. So there's a big, you know, there's a whole different conversation there as well, but you have to remember too, like there's not a lot of <laughs> what's the word I'm looking for. Like self like contractor scientists, they all work for like a school or a, a lab or a company or whatever. And there's, there's regulations there. It's like, it's also having a business. hundred percent. I was having a conversation with a client and she, like the doctor keeps crossing off her DHEA to get checked on a requisition, but the lab itself keeps canceling it. And like, she was like, I don't understand. Like, what is that person taking the vials and what do they care? And I said, it could be a supervision, just following a supervisor, just following orders. Right. So when it comes down to pharma, my view is this pharmaceutical companies on average pay for about 25% of med school. They sponsor, they pay for, they take care of all that stuff. And so if you're taking care of, you're sponsoring, you're in charge of what goes into the textbooks, you pay for the studies that get studied, therefore you pay for what gets published, you pay for what the doctors do and do not learn. When you have an influence what the doctors do and do not learn, regrettably, with any fault of their own, many doctors end up becoming glorified pharmaceutical reps. And pharmaceuticals are notorious for masking symptoms, not treating root causes. And so it comes back to this self-fulfilling prophecy where they keep people sick. And then when they're sick, well, guess what? You now have another diagnosis. A diagnosis for those who don't know, 
really means nothing. All a diagnosis is, is a quick picture snapshot, one word that describes all the symptoms. If someone says ulcerative colitis, perfect. You know, you got blood, you got ulcers, you got inflammation at somewhere in the colon. You can talk about different parts like pan colitis or whatever it may be. And then we know in one word, what kind of colitis you have, what's going on, what your symptoms are like. And with that comes a box. And with that box comes a check mark for a drug you get to give. If that one fails, here's the next drug and the next drug and the next drug. And so there's no real root cause in diving and digging into what's really causing the problem, just let's block the enzymes and molecular function for the symptoms don't show up. So we, we close the door and I'll tell my clients, just because you swept a bunch of stuff under your rug and threw laundry on your bed and closed the door doesn't mean the laundry has been folded and that the garbage, you know, the garbage is not, not there anymore. And so you can close the door, but it's still happening. It's going to show up somewhere else. The toxicity has to go somewhere. The inflammation has to go somewhere. Your body draws nutrients from all kinds of bank accounts throughout the body and your liver and your skin and your kidneys and all over, and they become depleted and other issues show up. And that before you know it, you got 40 different diagnoses and it's a chicken and egg now, which came first. So that's, that's why I always had that conversation with people so that they understand, mm. for example, is when we talk about how pharmaceutical industry doctors and everything they just treat they treat uh the symptom that is what they were trained to do yes right so that is where them to do it right and that is where i where i say i won't fault anyone in that position unless they so my like when i first started out uh i worked a lot of diabetes And I had a lot of people reverse their diabetes, but then doctors would be like type two diabetes is not curable. <laughs> right. And so like, if you under, like they've even, they've even cured type one diabetes, yeah. right? There's a couple cases of type one diabetes. Um, and so like, as soon as you say that you're setting people up for failure. So if, if you're sitting here and you're giving someone metformin or insulin or whatever, depending on the severity, I love type that is diabetes okay. when they give just more insulin. <laughs> <laughs> that So that is okay because you're just doing your job. But as soon as you say the words, this is incurable, now I fault you. Mm-hmm. Because now you're creating this false environment for somebody and you're really like, where I'm kind of going with this is the mind is so powerful. And so like those... Some people know that I worked with Alan and, and, and he had a very, very severe form of prostate cancer who, you know, if it wasn't for him, you know, uh, going separate ways, he probably would have been like completely, for all I know, it's out of his body right now. Like he's mm. still alive. They gave him eight months to live and it's been what? Like, well, I guess he wouldn't know, but like quite a few, like six plus years or something like that yeah. and whatnot. Mm. And he was one of the most positive human beings I ever met. All he did was laugh his ass off all the time, mm. joked about everything. And I would go to his oncologist visits with him and watch him get that Lupron shot, which was very heartbreaking to watch. Um, because well, of what it does to the body. Yeah. Um, but it's, they use Lupron for chemical castration. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I, I, I won't get into that, but there's a stance I feel on that. But anyways, um, <laughs> I would interview people there. I don't want you to interview. I just, I talk to people and the ones that were at the highest risk of, we'll just say death were the ones that were the most negative. Mm-hmm. And that is because they were told that they only have X amount of time to live. And so what happens in, in like with the psyche there is like, okay, well, it's like a couple of things go, you bummed out. Okay. Or maybe I don't, I've never been told I only have, I've been told you're lucky to be alive due to sure. my health conditions, but I've never been told you have X amount of time <laughs> to live. So like, I feel like someone would like either a either make the best of that or be completely bummed out, which is what I was getting. That was the information that I was receiving circle from these the people, for the next six, eight months. Right. And then that's how they end up dying. Like you look at studies done and there have been people where they have done knee surgery and they went on and fully healed and were totally fine. They showed them the video of them doing the knee surgery. They didn't actually do the knee surgery. Mm. They just acted like they did. They cut them open and everything. And they showed a filming of a different knee surgery. And these people went on and had their, they're fully healed, fully healed. Even more specifically, what's interesting to cancer, there are people, small studies, independent studies that have said you got six months, eight months to live to the day. That's when they die. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Well, there's another one too, genetics. So people, they would take these genetic tests and they would come back. Their genetics would be all right. But then the, whoever was conducting it would be like, Hey, like you actually came back with this genetic SNP. For those that don't know, that's a single nucleotide polymorphism 
which is think English. of it as a ladder. <laughs> and this ladder is you climbing your way to optimal health and wellness. If you have a genetic snip, you have a broken step on that ladder. Um, and so it's more difficult to get to where you want to go. Um, and but they never had the SNP, but then they retested the genetics three months later, three months later, and they had that SNP because they were told they had that SNP. So they started believing they had these issues. And actually in one of my courses I took, they went over a big subject on that mm. because it was just showing the power. The mind is the most powerful thing. Right. Unfortunately, we use it to make TikToks, but <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's an incredible amount of waste. The human, even the memory capacity, you know what I mean? I forget the exact number. I have to do the conversion and figure it out again. But the average human, it's something like three to four petabytes of information can be stored in the brain, Jeez. which for information purposes, for conversion, that's 300 million hours of high definition television stored inside your brain at any point in time you can access. We just don't do it. You remember growing up? Like, how old are you now? 32. Fuck yeah. So you grew up in the 90s, right? You were eight, what, 89? 90. 90? Okay. So, right, because I'm 92. I did bad math there. I don't know what happened. <laughs> the game is so, in numbers. <laughs> I remember, right? I love math and can't do it myself. That's why I love it. I love it just vicariously. But it's interesting because when I was a kid, I could rattle off 20 different seven-digit phone numbers. No problem, right? And I was like 10. Now? I hardly forget my, I forget my own half the time. So I don't have to remember it. So it really is. You don't use it. You lose it. The convenience aspect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so yep. we're trading all kinds of stuff for ease and convenience and the human brain, man, it's so capable just of storage and memory. But then that's, that's a shallow access to the mind, the human mind, what it's actually capable of doing on just a subatomic level. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely astonishing. If you look at guys like Joe Dispenza and the, the the studies that they do, I don't know enough about it to have an educated opinion to talk an entire podcast on it, but I've gone through some of the basic stuff. Some people say he's a quack or I want to see studies. Well, the studies Who's you're looking at, Joe Dispenza. Sounds familiar. So he works in the realm of quantum physics. He's the guy who focuses, you'll see him through like advertisements on Facebook for Gaia and all kinds of stuff. But he talks about the power of the mind on this same level on how it can heal itself and cure itself. These martial artists who will break their spine and sit and meditate for a year in bed, never supposed to walk again and their vertebrae are completely healed in two years time. They're back into martial arts again because the human mind is fully capable of dominating and controlling the body in every sense of the matter. And he really dives into this on a subatomic. It's a quantum physics and how it all works and why it all works. And it's really amazing. But then we hear because we're conditioned, well, show me the studies. Well, these are the studies. Well, they're not good enough because they're not double blind placebo controlled studies in an environment that costs millions of dollars sponsored by big pharma. And so we're actively looking for pharmaceutical backed evidence, which is biased to pharmaceuticals, right? Yeah. And so we're lacking a lot of what the human body and mind is truly capable of. Yeah. I'm going to make one more comment on this and let's get back to you. Talk about you again. Um, but so like when you talk about these people like meditating in bed and such, this is like, obviously, yes, children have much healthier cells than adults do because less exposure to poor environments over time. Um, it's just, you know, higher levels of growth hormone and so on and so forth. But I truly believe one reason children heal very well as well is because they don't have that thought process that adults do. Right. When it, when, if you break, if you broke, like act for you, it'd probably be okay if you broke your arm. Maybe I could be wrong. Same with me. Like I could still do my job, but let's sure. say you were a physical labor and you broke your arm you're going to lose a bunch of money and that's going to stress you the hell out. And that's going to like really impact your immune system and, and all sorts of things. Yeah. And then you're going to really, you know, inhibit that healing process where a child could care less. It's like snowboarding. Kids are so good at snowboarding. Yes. Low center of gravity. Okay. Sure. But no fear. They haven't experienced hurt or they don't have to worry about a job or right? they, yeah. they have no but fear. I, yeah. They, they don't understand what the damage can be done. They don't correlate. If I fall and break my knees sideways around a tree, I'm crippled for life. They're like, eh, whatever. Yeah, and they're right? actually better. They're less injury prone and they get injured less often because they worry less. Well, think of it like a drunk person in a car. I was going to say the they exact have a higher same thing. chance of survival. Yeah. Right. They're not tensing and, up. Yeah. And so like, if people are wondering why the hell I'm talking about this, it just goes back to the, the power of the mind. Yeah. Right. In, in all aspects. So, but anyways, okay. Let's, okay. So you <laughs> went, so the, the whole paramedic and we're, then we're what was, there, okay. what was the, uh, transition aspect there? What made you decide? Cause I know you talked about fulfillment and such, but something had to have sparked it that, okay, like this isn't what I want to do. This is what I'm going to go into. Sort of. So remember I talked about being the most uninteresting man in the world. That's is part of it. So I actually tried to get my license transferred. I graduated from Ontario and I worked in Newfoundland, rural Newfoundland. Sorry, license transferred? Yeah. So as a paramedic, 
doctors and nurses, they can travel nationally and some even internationally through US and Canada and kind of all over the place. Even some Europe, don't quote me on this, but maybe through Europe and other countries under the same umbrella can just transfer, do a quick test and boom, you're good. Doctors and nurses can just go and get the job anywhere in Canada they want. But paramedics, because provincial regulations are slightly different on different drugs they give, epinephrine, salbutamol doses, really basic stuff. And so I have to actually write a new test and recertify for each province I apply to. And so as a paramedic, I graduated from Ontario and then I went to, to Newfoundland. I wrote the test there, became a paramedic in Newfoundland and I worked out there for about a year. And then my transition was actually coming back. I wanted to get a job in Ontario. They paid twice as much, right? And then I couldn't find a job. So I started looking. I literally drove every city all the way to Sudbury, from Windsor to Sudbury. For those of you who don't know, that's about an eight hour distance of driving. I took two or three days, met every, went to every ambulance base, talked to every manager, looked for employment, couldn't find anything. I was like, well, I'm going to Alberta. I got friends out here. My brother's out here. The money's good. It was right in the boom of the oil as well. After 08, when things started to, to slink back up in 2014, 15. So I came out here and I couldn't find uh, work at the time. And my license wouldn't transfer. I had to write this jurisprudence test. So instead of going through and writing about drugs and doses and medical and doing trauma testing and your actual skill set, we had questions on the test. Like if there's a complaint against you for professional misconduct, how many members of what board sit on the hearing committee? And I had to do that test instead. And so I couldn't get it transferred for whatever reason. I failed the test like 10 times. Get this open book. I had myself, a friend of mine who was applying out here, and my dad, who's very tech savvy, he's a computer programmer as well. We all had all the documents, we're finding speed, control F, couldn't find this shit, failed by one to two marks every time. To me, I'm like, I'm not supposed to be here, right? I'm a Christian, I believe God like has his hand in a lot of different things, and I think I was just not supposed to be a paramedic out here, because I am where I am now. So in the meantime, to pay for my way, I became a personal trainer. I've been in the fitness world for years anyway. So this is back in 2014, probably. So I became a personal trainer, started working at World Health. It's like just a regular big old gym we have here in Alberta, kind of like Good Life Fitness or whatever else, Fit for Less. And so I was working there, worked there for about a year. Somebody gave me tickets to a business seminar. Like, hey, just got these tickets. I can't go. Do you want to go? I was like, yeah. So I went and I worked at a seminar called Make Your Mark by Colin Sprake. And he's a he's a great business guy. He's been through Dragon's Den and he's you know done very, very well for himself. And he talked about the importance of starting a business, how to leverage, how do you get there? What does it look like to start a business? What kind of freedom can you have? And I went in, man, this was end of November, probably 2014, maybe 15. I left that weekend. I was like, I'm quitting my job. And so I had set everything in motion to quit by about April. Well, January came around and started talking to my clients. And I was like, hey guys, I spent a year building a relationship with these people, right? And I'm like, I'm going to be leaving soon, but just so you're not high and dry. I said, I can't contact you. If you need anything from me, you can contact me. But per my, my agreement, legally, I can't reach out to you guys. It's called solicitation. I can't contact you. So here's who I recommend you work with. And I started setting them up with different personal trainers. Okay. So this is the clients from World Health. From World Health. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I was like, you, I can't take you with me, but here are the trainers I believe would be a best fit for you. Otherwise, what the gym would have done is just give them to whoever's new because they need clients to keep them in so they can get up the sales. And so I'm not letting them do that. And so anyway, I try to set them up and figure out where they're going to go. And word got around to the general manager who decided, well, that solicitation, you're gone. And so he misquoted me, took everything out. I actually have a lifetime ban that still stands to this day. I still can't go to that gym. I tried actually, I tried to go in, talk nutrition because my old manager was back there on a contract. He's like, yeah, let's set something up. We'll take your services. We'll contract you in. Head office saw I still had a lifetime ban. I talked to him about it. They still won't lift it. Really? This was like two weeks ago. <laughs> so here we are eight, nine years later. I still yeah. have a ban. But uh, anyway, I started my own business. And as I started working with certain clients, like Lynn, she's had an amazing transformation. We started together at World Health when she was 57 years old, 19 pills in a shot of insulin in the morning, seven pills and insulin for bedtime, slept with a CPAP, high blood pressure, heart issues, all kinds, diabetic, the works. Two years after we were working together, she broke her first world record as a weightlifter. And I was like, there's something more to this. Yeah. Like I got to learn. And so I started diving in. And so as things became more and more clear that there's more to the body than just calorie counting and exercise in what I was taught from traditional medicine, I realized that on the holistic perspective, there's more to it. The detoxification systems, the body's ability to manage and repair and heal itself, what the reversal process looks like, getting to the root cause of what her illnesses were. And I sort of figured this out all on my own. And I'm like, man. 
this is amazing. I started my own business, became a trainer, started working more into those very weird cases. You get people coming in that if you see the Mayo Clinic, they've had issues going on for years. I had a fella come in with, uh, I'm using heavy air quotes for you who aren't on video, piriformis syndrome, right? And it was all locked up. Well, I've been working with chiropractors now. I've been shadowing under athletic therapists and sports therapists. And I realized he's got imbalances in his head, neck, and spine that are inhibiting muscles. Now, musculature when inhibited. And by that, I mean your body needs 100% power supply in its muscles, right? To work perfectly. But if somebody comes in, they have malalignments or compression or whatever it is, anywhere in the head, neck, and spine, those muscles now have, say, a 50% power supply. So they're not strong. No matter how much you work out, that muscle A will not fire properly or B, you'll fatigue and never get stronger. You hit a ceiling. And so we have to uncompress to uninhibit the muscles. Well, if they're currently inhibited, the body has a strength tension ratio. It can't be 100% strong. It's only 50% strong. So what does it do to balance that out? It adds 50% more tension. And now you have these tight points. People develop what they think is carpal tunnel syndrome. Well, it's coming from the neck and the shoulder because the inhibitory chain from the head, neck, shoulder down to the wrist has strained the muscles. Muscle strain at tendons, tendons in the wrist become inflamed. Now you have what looks to be carpal tunnel. You go for surgery and it comes back six months later because they didn't fix it. It's the head and neck. And so as I dove into this more and more, I was like, man, there's more to it. And so I went back to school. I became a holistic nutritionist and I started getting into the gut space. And it just, the more and more I got into it, it all came back to head, neck, spine and gut for me. Even people's guts are affected by their head, neck and spine. And so now that I'm in this field, I'm sure I'll evolve and niche down again eventually. But as it stands, if you have a healthy head, neck, spine, and of course it's going to connect to your lymphatic system and a healthy gut, everything also fix itself. Like you mentioned like the head, neck and affecting the gut or whatever. A lot of the times, um, like when I was getting really big into gut health and everything, like even with my own case was like you're like okay like well what bacteria is going on sort of inflammation you're looking at like whole systems and such and a lot of the time it's just in your head yeah right and um like i was just mentioning this like on a video i created yesterday and i think i talked about this with uh, my last podcast guest like one of my clients right now is is improving her stress managed drastically through specific measures and we haven't changed anything and those specific measures have nothing to do with like what I programmed and like the difference in the bloat and inflammation and everything over like one night was just drastic. Mm. Right. And it's something to do with her work. And so, and so like that, a lot of it, because when you look at the central nervous system, I mean, like it it starts with the central nervous system uh, and how it affects everything. Now, yes, everything else is going to affect the central nervous system as well. It's not just its own separate entity, um, but understanding that like you wonder, like you can even go back to the carpal tunnel in your wrist or whatever. Mm-hmm. Well, yes, there's going to be repeat, repetitive movements or poor lifestyle or something that can contribute to that, but also too, just like the amount of stress that people are suffering with. And this is why like the comment where you made, where we don't remember phone numbers. Yes, it is to do with convenience because everything mm-hmm. is in our phone, but it's also to do with the society that we live in now and our actual cognitive capacity, True. right? Like our ability to use our brain to its fullest potential as it should. I'm not meaning that whole, we only use 10% of our brain thing. I'm just meaning like the actual efficacy our brain could provide in our mm-hmm. daily lives has been severely compromised. Sure. I mean, if I could use hundred percent and develop telekinetic abilities, I would do it. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and so it's a big, a big societal thing. It, yeah. and, it, and when I say that, like it's more than just like what you watch and read in the news, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's like, I got carpets in here, you know, and this isn't my place to take them out, but I would take them out. You know, and I should really like, obviously I'm not going to have an air purifier, air purifier running during a podcast, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, there should be an air purifier here. I have one in my bedroom and one in the living room. Yeah, I got sick as soon as I walked in the room. So <laughs> yeah, right. Like, but, it, it, but that's literally like joking or not, that is what can happen to people. And it's like, so for example, like I had high levels of mycotoxins, which is uh, mold metabolites. And I, if I walked into a room, I knew there was mold present because I would either get asthma or my joints would start to hurt mm. or I would get moody or I would bloat just entering a house, right? Because you're, you're absorbing more mycotoxins and you're, you're affecting the systems even further. 
And so like as a society, there's so much, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking back to like your TikTok with the chemicals found in foods and everything. There's so much in a daily basis. And so like you venture into all these avenues that you have, the central nervous system, the gut health and everything. And that's what it takes a lot for people to understand is like you go and, and this is why I always say to think outside of the textbook because mm -hmm. the textbook says this, you know, for example, like you got your GI map sure. back yeah. and we even talked about it in our last mentor call with your one client where I was like, we got to look at everything away from the GI map. Right. And so, yeah, that's addressing the root cause. Now, not saying that, you know, the environment is the root cause per se, but it could be contributing to it. But that's what people see is we use, you mentioned like, what was the words you used? Um, like when it studies and everything, and we're so conducive to that, it's the same thing. We get a piece of paper, you get a test result. Like, let's say you got, you know, high blood pressure. So you're going to be so focused on that high blood pressure and what medication do I take? Or like my clients would be like, what supplement do I take? Mm. Right. Or what should I do? And I was like, well, when was the last time you chilled the F out? <laughs> when yeah. was the last time you went? I will say this a thousand times over with aggression. When was the last time you left the city and went for a walk in the mountains or by the river or something? And they won't have an answer. I was like, that's why your blood pressure is high. You know, I was just talking about this last night, actually. I do, I'm in a couple of different Facebook groups I, I administrate, and we were talking about alternative recommendations for digestive health, right? In this IBS group. And one of the things we were talking about was actually going barefoot in the grass. So if you actually look at live blood analysis, you can see grounding. what's called grounding. Yeah. yeah. So you can see blood stasis where the blood cells they are not clotted, but they kind of clump together. They don't move very smoothly. When you actually ground, you're barefoot in the grass, 10, 15 minutes, you can lay in the grass, you touch nature. The earth takes those negative ions, discharges them from your body, and you go back 10 minutes later to the same live blood analysis, same spot in the body, and you'll see the blood looks completely different. It flows totally different. And that blood stasis will literally stop you from healing. It's mm -hmm. incredible. Yeah, and that once again, too, like a lot of people will go, oh, that's quack or whatever. There's tons of evidence about what yeah, grounding You just does, don't know. Right? Yeah. And like, obviously, it's quack, it's difficult here. Wrong. Like, I'm not going to be walking barefoot outside minus 30. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, I've done it. It's not but, fun. <laughs> but that's, okay, so that <laughs> just made me think of a conversation at the gym. I was, I was eavesdropping. And there's two guys, and they were talking about, was it, and you can't quote me on this, but it was like knee pain or something and whatnot. And because so like a lot of people get knee pain because of the front of their calf is not functional because nobody ever loads it up with tension and, and activates it. And so like you can look it up, the extensor hallucius longus. Okay. It goes from a great goes name. from your toes all the way up to your knee. It's the only mm -hmm. way it's the longest one in, on the front of your calf. I call it front of your calf just for simplicity for people to understand. Working that can contribute to a lot of knee, like positive knee benefits. But the thing is, is like they were talking about this and I said, it's shoes, right? Like we're supposed to use our feet, okay? I don't care what anybody says, we evolved from Lucy, okay? We're supposed to use our feet. Yes. When we're sitting, when we're using shoes, you are losing a lot of those foot mechanics. And it was so funny because they were like, huh? And then, and then the conversation continued after I piped up and they're like, yeah, I just, I don't know where it comes from. I was like, you just like- I, ju I just I, told you. <laughs> but that's what I mean, right? Now, whether that's just because they don't respect someone like me, that's fine, right? They don't know me, but it's, that's where people are at. So when you, if you were to mention something like grounding to that individual, it, it would- Gone. Right? And that's important though, that it's like Chinese medicine, right? Chinese medicine. And I'll be honest too. When I got my TCM certification, I was like I super you got excited. Your TCM certification. I got a lot of things, but <laughs> you have, <laughs> um, I was super excited learning about it. It just made perfect sense to me. It made perfect sense to me. And my own experience with other Chinese modalities was everything fell into place. I was like, this is amazing. But I got a little too excited and implemented it too fast without like a complete understanding of other like full. I understood the systems from a Chinese medical aspect, but then understanding like other, I mean, so I won't get sure. too deep into it. But so it kind of like, I'll just say for lack of a better term, it didn't work as yep. it should have, or as I learned. Right. Right. And then a lot of people feel that way. So Chinese medicine is a joke. People don't believe in it. Right. Well, the reality is Chinese medicine focuses a lot on the San Jiao, which is the lymphatic system. We need to talk about this. Yeah. Right. If you're not supporting the other systems and you're trying to, you're only focusing on that lymphatic system, you're not going to get a lot of headway. 
And the reason being though, that the Chinese are like that and they see those results because they don't have the same gut issues, the same liver issues, the same like kidney issues, the same neurological issues that we do in Western society. So that's why you talked about like coaching clients in Europe. They're a lot easier to work with because they don't have the same issues. North America is bar none, the sickest nation on earth. 100%. And it's all due to convenience. It's all due to convenience and enjoyment and like that dopamine and serotonin response. We're focused on convenience and entertainment above all else. Right. And it is good. I will love smashing triple cheeseburgers with large <laughs> fries and cheesecake. You know, sure. I love you know, like adrenaline rushes and everything. You know, yep. um, TikTok consumes me sometimes. I love adrenaline. My wife won't let me skydive anymore, but she's nervous. <laughs> why? Like, oh, accident or something? Yeah, she's worried I'm just going to fall my parachute one open. You know why I won't skydive? Because hmm. you can't go on your own for like so many jumps. Yeah, I think you got to do 200 jumps tandem or something. Yeah, and I just, I don't want to jump with somebody. Let me, do, leave me to my own device. Yeah. <laughs> I went tandem. It was kind of, it was nice and warm and comforting. <laughs> <laughs> don't pee on me. Um, but anyways, yeah, like, you know, you're right. North America is, and like, there are other countries too that aren't as healthy, but it's like a good example is if you look into the research, you look at like, um, that you're able we'll to say Europe as a whole, like let's say towards Greece and everything where they're heavily reliant or sorry, big advocates of the Mediterranean diet. Okay. Yeah. Now you look at their genes, they suck. They're not good genes. So how does these, how do these people with very poor genes have one of the lowest amount of genes disease? suck? What do you mean? Like their genetics, they're, like they're just, they're just they predisposed have exposed to certain conditions. Yeah. They have high level, like they have numerous genetic snips that mm -hmm. are uh, predisposed to specific diseases. They gotcha. have a lot of MTHFR, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. Yeah. So like uh, methylation. methylation issues. Yeah. And so and then we go, okay, well then how are they so healthy? It's the diet and the lifestyle. Like it's like, first of all, they do have much nicer weather than Canada. I think that plays a big role because winter can be very depressing for people at 27 months out of the year, hundred percent. Right. And so like it, the actual geographical situation makes a big difference as well. Right. Um, but quick segue. Well, I want to come back to this. Sorry. No, that's good. Did you know there was a study that came out of the early nineties was 91, but there was a study that the sun does not cause cancer. It does cause cancer when we're in inflamed states, like eating fast food all the time. Yeah. Like sunburn is inflammation. Sure. And so it just raises that bar. That's what a lot of people don't understand is like, you can't fully blame it on one thing. That's why I always say everything gives you cancer. It's because it's as a whole. And, cumulative. Sure. Right. And we're sitting. So 30 years ago on a scale of one to 10, the average individual is probably hovering around a three. Sure. We're now hovering around a six or a seven, and that's probably disease threshold. Mm -hmm. So you get multiple sunburns or it's like tanning. They say tanning gives you cancer. It's like, well, if anything, the lotion is going to give you cancer, not the actual tanning bed, but the like, chemicals and endocrine disrupting chemicals. Yeah, and, yeah. Right. But the actual act of tanning is nowhere near as bad as people think it is. Right. I describe it like, like I do stress, right? It's a cup of water. Everything bucket, yeah. fills more water into that glass. When it overflows, you have symptoms. Yeah. We have a very poor rate at draining our buckets. Yes, we do. Right. And that's where stress management is so important. And so, yeah, that's what like, it was the same whole situation on the jab, right? People are talking about everything that's occurring with them. And it's just like, well, you know, like they're talking about an inflammatory response. That's just its job. It's just what it's supposed to do. I but still you're don't seeing, trust it worth a damn though, man. The amount of blood clots. People don't clot in but, the iliac arteries and they're but, clotting in the iliac arteries. But once arteries. again though, right? Remember, these people are sitting at a higher inflammatory response. So 30 years ago, it wouldn't have had that same impact. It wouldn't have, it wouldn't have probably caused the what they claim to be the side effects now. Oh, I, I still believe it's a big population control conspiracy. So <laughs> I don't I don't try not to venture into that kind of stuff. The yeah. only aspect I venture into the platform that for is, this, but is I don't venture into the plot uh, politics aspect. I venture mm -hmm. into like the actual like physiological aspects of it. But of course, you're going to get caught in the crossfire where you do hear a few things. And yeah. so you can't go into that fight without taking an arrow to the butt once in a while. Right. So yeah. all I say though, is just you, you, that exact analogy is perfect. Your cup of water is already too full and you're adding more water to yeah. it. Right. And then this is what's resulting in a lot of the health complications that we are suffering with these days. That's why I say like we were talking about the carpet in the room. 
right? If you got a full cup, like carpet can house like chemicals, first of all, what it's made of, but then it also can house a lot of bacteria and everything. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of those situations where it could overfill your cup. Something as simple as carpet Gross. can do that. You know what I mean? So it's one of those things where the objective now is yes, you take a test, you take a GI map, you got an overgrowth. We got to focus on that overgrowth, but we also have to look at the stress reduction aspect, right? Right. The stress reduction and the stress management aspect, because if you constantly have a full cup when you're trying mm -hmm. to heal, it's just not going to work out. No, absolutely right? agreed. So with, with paramedic, sure. would you say the experience as a paramedic helped you with what you do now? That's a big yes and no, actually. So one end, absolutely not, because I didn't learn anything there that I've used like in terms to get of here. Physiology, the education on how things work and understanding the baseline of the body has definitely helped. Right? It's it's almost like you know if I'm in construction and I am a framer, right? That might help me when I go into engineering because I understand the basics of mechanics and angles and I understand, you know, how things work on a very basic level, right? And so it's kind of the same type of transition. I'm speaking that it's probably a poor analogy for someone who's actually an engineer or a framer, but the idea being there's correlation because I have a really great foundation for understanding physiology and science and even a little bit of genetics and all kinds. And my brain, it's just like you, right? This is just what we're meant to do. We are designed to be, we are we, as a gift, are able to work in health at a very high level. And so, you know those N-chroma glasses? No. So, give you an idea. I'm, I'm working on some new stuff right now because I will, no, I will never in my life sit on a new idea ever again. I have had over $400 million worth of ideas that I didn't pursue, didn't know how to pursue, or just sat on for too long. So, three examples. Number one was back in high school. My buddy and I had a design. We're going to call it find your shit. And what it was, was, I mean, at the time back in high school, it would have been an alarm code, like an alarm pad at the door with buttons <coughs> with a little sender receiver. You'd attach one to your wallet, to your phone, to your keys, the shit you lose all the time. The alarm set number one, press it. Can't find my keys. Beep, beep, beep. You go and find it. Well, now they have something called tile, which you can have attached to your keys in your wallet, your wherever, and is a sender receiver. So if you lose your stuff, you ping the tile. <coughs> I had another idea back in college for the squatty potty because I understand it. I understood. Yes, I love the squatty it's brilliant, potty. right? Because yeah. I mean, that's how humans were not meant to, 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 to avoid at a 90 degree angle. So I had the idea for the squatty potty in college. $150 million idea. Same thing with uh, Tile. Is another, now? Yeah. Tile's over $100 million, $150 million. They partner with Skull Candy and all kinds. And then back in college, during in paramedics, we cover a huge range. And we went into a small ophthalmology. We learned about the eyes and the lenses and how they work, how they take in vision and color and sight. And I had this idea. I'm like, if you could just basically change the basic refraction of how the brain is receiving the signal, theoretically, you could actually correct color blindness. Well, these glasses and chroma are designed to do exactly that. You put the glasses on, it changes oh, the refraction, yeah. and colorblind people can now see color. I've seen those videos. Right? Yeah. $100 million idea. So I'm like, I don't remember how I got on this topic here, but long and short, I will never sit on another idea again. And so I'm just everything I'm pursuing relentlessly because that's $400 million that I is not mine. Now. <laughs> yeah. Jeez, eh? I don't know how I got to that question. That's my ADHD brain, but that's, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> so what, what are your future endeavors then like with what you do? Because you mentioned that you like specialize in like IBD and IBS and all sort of colitis mm. um, and like the holistic nutrition aspect. Yeah. So what are your future endeavors? Like, what are you looking to achieve? Is it just following this current path that you're on and continuing to help people? Mm. Or is there an, another picture? I don't know. I know I love what I do. I love helping people, but I think where I want to go, because I also love the aspect of business, right? For me, it's not so much about the money. The money is nice to have, but I do a lot. I, I shouldn't say this on a public platform, but I do a fair bit of pro bono for people who just can't afford it. I know you do as well, right? I'll discount rates where I need to or work privately with people for free because, you know, like I'm working with a woman right now who's very, very sick, full of H. pylori and candida in the works, and she's breastfeeding, right? So her baby's sick. They tested positive for H. pylori. So I'm like, I can't, and she can't, just can't afford it. She's living in, I wouldn't say total poverty, but pretty close. What most would be considered under the poverty line. So I'm like, she can't afford my services, but I can't let her and her kid get sick, right? So I love doing that aspect for people. On the other hand, I want to teach more. For me, it's, it's very fulfilling. And I, I believe that 
what I can do, what I've been able to do with people in their health over the years, if I can teach others to do that, I can then replicate what I'm doing so we can reach more people faster. And also I've recently become a musician. I'm super medium, like very mediocre, um, but I love music. I've got a proclivity for music. You, should talk, you know, Sean, my good friend, Sean from the UK. No, I don't know any of your friends. I thought you've met him at the gym before. Maybe. He comes to the gym or whatever. What's Anyways, he look like? He, he's a, he was a musician or whatever. What's, what's he look like? Uh, really tall, like really tall. No, so. <laughs> Mark's the only six, six foot seven guy. No. Anyways, you should talk to him sometime because Love he's that. a musician or whatever. Like he's an engineer now, but uh, he was in a band and everything. Mm. Like like hardcore though, not like just That's like right. in our garage thing, like concerts and everything. That's huge. Whatnot, yeah. See, I'd love that. I want to pursue music more. Um, so I why just music? recently, I've got a proclivity. I okay. always have. Since I was a kid, I've always wanted to get into music. My family's very musical. My youngest brother plays the piano. My old, my uh, both younger brothers play. Um, my dad's been a I musician for that. yeah. Oh, well, there yeah. you go. Right, <laughs> I talk to my mom, and so my dad's been a musician for fifty years. His dad was a musician. It's they, kind it, of in your blood. Then, it's right? kind of in the blood, and I've yeah. always wanted to. But I've come to terms with the fact that I have a learning disability. Right, I do have ADHD, clinically diagnosed, moderate to severe, which I've much corrected actually with your help through gut and all kinds of and stuff. We'll definitely be correcting um, it further. <laughs> very much, yeah. And once I clear my candida, I'm going to be so much better. But I've always sort of delayed, like the things people found funny when they were 15. I didn't find funny till I was 20. You know what I mean? And so oh, even like just, just not getting the just joke? not getting it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. and even like athletics, what kids could do when they were 10, I couldn't do till I was 15. Mm. But I was really good when I was 15. I was I was wrestling at a very high level. I was a gold medalist across the board. So like I, I picked up, but music, I never really got it. And now I'm 30 and I'm picking it up and I, I can play it for you at some point here. I produced my first song and you That's know what, what? you're talking about yeah. earlier. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so my goal this year was to produce my own song from not to have help. So what friend of mine has been a musician for many years as well. We used to work together actually back at world health. And so he's a drummer. He plays all kinds of instruments. He's now in production design and he travels all over the States for it. And so he's picked up some big clients. He's worked with like Mother Mother. Have you ever heard of them? And so that sounds familiar. It, look him on Spotify. I'll see some of their some of their good okay. stuff. But long and short, he's done a lot of work with these people, and he's helped me. He'll produce the beat. I'm a lyricist. I write poetry, and so. I decided, well, I want to get into music. How do I make it to music? And so he helped me make that conversion from just words over to music. And my goal this year, I wanted to write, I wanted to compose, edit, produce my very own song by myself. Well, now it's what, February 18th or something? Ish. 23rd. 23rd, learning disability. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've, it goes yesterday. I just finished the last edits on my track. I sent him the wave file. He'll have to master it because that's a whole Pretty other use, skill set. Logic Pro. Okay. Yeah, it's a it's an Apple product, so you I would think Sean you would get it. Own, yeah. Logic Super. Yeah, I used rad. to have Apple. <laughs> <laughs> you dirty Windows user. <laughs> and so I finally produced my own song, and so that that for me, I want to make time for music. I want to educate other people. I love working in the health field, but for me now, it's less about what I can do for other people, more about what I can help people do for other people. Because like we talked about that filling the void versus fulfillment. Yeah. My fulfillment is knowing the impact and the greater scheme I'm gonna make on this world and people and how they're living their lives or quality of life. Mm -hmm. When someone's got ulcerative colitis and they're going to the bathroom 30, 40 times a day, there's blood, they're fatigued constantly, hormonal issues, their anxiety, insomnia, they can't live their lives. I can give them that back. But it's no longer about what I can do and people looking to me as the master of what I can do for them and getting that void filled. It's about my fulfillment in the impact I can make by teaching others to do what I do and knowing that I'm making a footprint on the world even though my name and face isn't on it. And so if I can do that and grow the business in that way, mentorship and coaching programs, I can then have the freedom to do the things that do bring me other joy like music production. And so that's really where I want to go. I've just started a Taekwondo class. Like I'm just, I feel like Dwight Shoot. You ever watch The Office? I'm not real. I've watched all the bloopers, but mm. not the actual show. <laughs> so for Office fans, segue. Um, since I, I guess I've determined this episode's all about me anyway, so I'll just keep talking. <laughs> That's what I said, man. I'm a middle child. I like the attention. And so <laughs> I'm not perfect. And so in The Office, there's an episode in season one where Dwight, we find out he's in martial arts. And so he goes in and uh, he and Michael get into a fight. That's it's Steve Carell, right? That's Steve Carell, yeah. yeah. It's such Rain Wilson and Steve Carell. Yeah. And they go over to Dwight's dojo. And they're just like two morons just swinging these awkward punches. And, you know, Michael pins him down. He's like, I'm going to spit. And he's spitting in his mouth and just dumb <laughs> stuff, right? And so 
because I'm a super fan of the office, I have seen seasons one through nine, like probably 10, 11 times. I'm actually going through it again. I watch it every day. And so there's a podcast called office ladies. Now, Pam and Angela, the characters that's Jenna Fisher and Angela Kinsey have a podcast and their tagline is that like for real, they have, it, a, they podcast. have a podcast okay. for real. Yeah. And it's a, it's a, it's a rewatch podcast. They go back and watch the office and tell you the things that only two people who were there could tell you. They talk to the producers and behind the scenes and how the sets came together. And it's, it's the ultimate fan experience. I love their podcast. They're delightful women. And so they were talking about the set design for this fight where Michael and Dwight were fighting at Dwight's dojo. And in the set design, you can see in the dojo, there's a sign on the back wall and it's all written in Chinese or Korean or whatever language is in. And it says like the five tenets of karate. And it's things like, listen to your parents, do your homework, all these <laughs> things that like you wouldn't know unless you're on the set design. Walks on, walks off. <laughs> but just to really reinforce that Dwight Schrute is in a children's karate class. <laughs> right? That's what it's there for and it's just him and a bunch of kids and so i joined this taekwondo school came on high recommendation this guy jj park okay dude's legit he's i kind of fangirled a little bit that's so, another thing you should talk to sean about he i will a kung fu master oh man i did kung fu and all that so i'm in taekwondo i'm not a master though and so i joined this class and jj park he used to work he worked with jackie chan for like 10 15 years he stunted all over korea and india and china he's been in stunt movies and he's he's amazing you know he teaches this taekwondo school well i went in and it's three girls and a boy, all between the ages of like 10 and 12. And then on the wall, they have this poster and it's very traditional Korean. The top five things, be loyal to your country, listen to your parents and teachers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and so it's just man. me and I'm Dwight shooting a karate oh, class for kids so now. <laughs> but it's a lot of fun and I'm, uh, I'm enrolling actually. So it's, it's man, cool. all jokes aside, more people should do that kind of stuff. Never mind, like we've been talking like hell stuff, like just self defense, like having yeah. self defense. It's a scary world out there, man. Well, there's a reason I do that. I had my head bounced off a curb when I was 13. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Right. To have that confidence to be able kicked. to protect yourself, right? Yeah. I want to make a comment about the whole band situation. I was in band when I was in music situation. One time at band camp? Yeah. Exactly. Like I was in band. <laughs> the whole reason was because of like field trips and stuff. And I was just horrible. And I think it's because like they would say like I have ADD or something like that, but I didn't have ADD. I just didn't care. Like I just wasn't interested in these sure. things. I was interested in the field trips. <laughs> and so I just wouldn't really like pick up an instrument. I did like, I think eight or nine different instruments. Yeah. But when we have one time I was, I think I was bass guitar and we had an exam and like the way the school was set up, like we were bass, like guitar was way up at the back in the auditorium sure. or whatever. And uh, so when it was my turn to play, my buddy would actually be plugged into my amp and and he, she'd be like, okay, play whatever. And he would play <laughs> he would it. Play but like it. whatever, like notes over here, I'd be like up here. <laughs> she like thought on right away. She knew. <laughs> I, got, I got kicked out of band and everything. <laughs> actually, they let me try a different instrument. I did like the trombone. I did the clarinet. I did, I didn't do the flute. What else did I do? I played Trumpet. the flute actually. And I got made I fun did. of for being a metal penis. Cause we're I think doing that the was with the grade. clarinet too. They made a lot of fun of men playing the clarinet too. Yeah. I think I tried. Uh, okay. Actually, here's what it is. I wanted to play the drums mm. and this is what I absolutely despise about the education system. We had to do something at first, every time in band class, you had to do something. I don't remember what it was and I didn't have a hang of it. So they wouldn't let me play drums yeah. instead of teaching me. You either and, have it and move on or you don't. Yeah. yeah. And, and instead of teaching me, because so where my goals, mine goes with this is I wanted, I love dance. I am white though, so I cannot dance. I could teach you, man. I was a competitive dancer. Were you? Yeah. Well, so um Maybe I'm not that boring. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. So uh an old client of mine, he is a dance instructor or choreographer. I apologize if I'm butchering it. Um, but we I was gonna take lessons through him. And I asked him, like, is this even possible? Is this am I can I actually even dance? Hmm. And he told me, he was like, he, was it his mentor? Come, like, don't call me. I apologize, Josh, if I'm messing this up. But essentially this guy should not have been a dancer. And he ended up being his mentor or whatever, right? And so like, just if you don't have it in the beginning, it doesn't mean you can't not, cannot be taught. Like, Absolutely. you know what I mean? And so like, that was for me, like I always hated the education system. Like I dropped out of school. I hate it. I dropped out. Yeah, clearly you're a hillbilly. Right. <laughs> like bum. Like yeah. I just, I hated school because I hated the teachers. <clears throat> I hated the education system, even from a young age that people would probably make fun of me thinking you don't understand it. No, I, I thought it was stupid. Right. I did yep. not feel like I was learning. 
I did not feel like I was learning. The education system is an old Prussian system that's designed to make good workers. It comes back from the state of Prussia. That's what our North American education system is bounced off of. And it goes back to teaching people how to do what they're told, not to critically think for themselves, which is why critical thought is rare enough to be a superpower. Yeah. And I think that critical thought, the lack of, um, is also do the convenience thing as well. You know, for example, like chat GPT. Mm. Yeah, you don't, you don't, you don't to, gotta think. You just type in a chat GPT and chat GPT will think for you. Yeah. It'll write, it'll type, it'll create for you. It'll right. have to everything. Like you don't need to yeah. learn anymore. Like we're they're becoming, talking about essays and Yeah. We're we're moving away from chefs to being line cooks in right? our everyday life. Right. And and I mean, if that's the way the future is going, then that's called evolution, right? And that's called adaptability. And so then you have to kind of like adapt to that because you're not gonna win that know, fight. Man, I've seen Wally. <laughs> I haven't seen Wally. <laughs> no. I, no. I know it's about like yeah. the end of the world kind of thing. And like and really everybody obese evolves and the little beasts riding around in chairs yeah. and everything's done for you. <laughs> yeah. And like that is not far fetched by any means at all. If you really yeah, think about close. it, but it's like, it's the same with like politics, right? Like politics where they say, I, I, everybody's like, I might even lose followers for this. I've never voted in my entire life. I've never voted because at the end of the day, whoever is in power, I still have to do what I'm going to do. So if someone comes in power, that affects my job, I have to adapt. I will vote because I need to feel like I'm doing what I can to get Trudeau out, but that's it. <laughs> See, I can't comment because I don't know anything about anything. Mm. Right? People tell me, but I never researched, so I cannot have my own opinion. Right. On it. Then your only opinion you have is based on what somebody else's bias Which is not fed my you. Opinion. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And so I won't, I won't ever talk to anybody about politics. Yeah. Like I'll listen to them because you know, a lot of people seem to love to talk about politics, but it's why I've never voted because I'm like, okay, you could say the comment, like, um, you vote to get Trudeau out. Well, True. I don't know who I'm voting for. So I could be voting in someone worse. I could be, who knows what I'm doing. So I just won't vote period. I believe in politics. It is the lesser of the two evils. Yeah. I think, I think, I mean, I know we don't want to talk politics. All those things aside, Pierre Polyev is our best shot. I believe Canada has. I've been following him for a long yeah, time. I don't even know who that is. But again, <laughs> you know what? There's two things I like about him. Now, a lot of people, as soon as you mix like politics and religion or politics and medicine and anything, it gets skewed. doesn't matter. But there is a certain value system. Um, he's either Catholic or Christian or something. And there's great values there. As long as you're not like Old Testament, you know, uh, fire and brimstone follower. Okay. But at See, the I same time. about religion either. So. Oh, that's all right. I'm, I'm not religious either by any means. There's a difference between. It's a whole another podcast. But anyways, so Pierre Polyev, he's just got great moral values. Justin Trudeau, the way I look at it, he's been ethically charged several times, completely has 100% broken the ethics laws. It's just the ethics commission is nobody does anything. Like breaking ethics in Canada is a joke. There's been embezzlement and lying and manipulation and all kinds and sexual harassment, all kinds of stuff. And he gets away with it. And the country's just gone to shit from everything I pay attention to. And so I know a couple of my wife's relatives actually we all just found out recently that they actually vote for Trudeau. And so I've, I've actually lost a lot of respect for them <laughs> because they're all teachers. So, okay. Cause this doesn't, I heard that. So, because like, there's going to be a specific demographic that's going to vote for a specific individual because it's going to better their lives. Is that not the case? Yes. So they're teachers and educators. And the one thing that he's done minus like healthcare and everything else going to shit. Um, but it's, it's great for teachers. His policies just benefit the education. And so my view on this is if you are willing to let the rest of the country go to shit because it benefits you in your position, then I lose a lot of respect for you as an individual because it takes away from the greater good for your own personal gain, which is capitalism at its finest in the worst way. I'm, I'm a capitalist. I love capitalism. But when it, it comes down to burning other people, right, in order to get what you want, that the epitome of it to me is like the Kissinger Report. You familiar? So it's out of the 60s, 70s, whenever it is. But Henry Kissinger put a clause into place. It's in the United States. In the short of it is, this is the, this is the abridged version. Africa has resources we want. We need to destroy and control that population so they can't grow so we can continue abusing and raiding their resources for our own good. The United States needs what Africa has. And because of that, you look at all the medical treatments, all the things that go wrong, the sterilization, the poverty, the abuse, the cobalt mines, all of that still exists today. And there's an impoverished country that should, by all rights, be freaking Wakanda because of the resources they have, but it's been so abused and manipulated and dredged over because the states use it for personal gain. That, to me, is basically the extrapolated version of voting for somebody that burns everyone because it benefits you. That's how I look at it. So do you think these people are aware of this though? 
I think it's willful ignorance. Yeah. Yeah. You're choosing to be ignorant and you can talk about it, but if you refuse to listen or hear the other side or actually do the research to face what you may have done or the choices you may be making, the impact they're making, it is willful ignorance and ignorance becomes bliss for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I know like we I, segued off of health to politics. <laughs> that's, but. That's, that's totally fine. Um, no, that's exactly it. Because I don't know anything about this stuff at all. Because I like I, I devoid my time to like specific things and just. I feel if I were to pay attention to this stuff, it would take away from me being able to be the best I can be, not only for myself, but others as well. It distracts the shit out of me for sure. Yeah, a hundred percent. Right. And so I'm very selective about what I choose to let distract me. And I, I just, the way I hear people talk about politics, I'm like, yeah, I don't want to get into that. And I don't mean like, I don't want to have that conversation. They like get heated though. Right. But, but like, I just don't want my brain to go there. Cause I do people call me, they tell me I'm a part of the problem because I don't vote. Right. And, and so I think, and and I don't understand why. So I'm not, I'm just going to say, okay, I'm just going to be like, okay, well, that's how you feel. And I'm not going to negate your feelings. But you're part of the problem if you don't vote, but then you're part of the problem if you vote for who they don't vote for. You know what I mean? So you can't win. You can't win. You you can't Unless you're doing what I want you to do. You're a problem. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. And like, I know in terms of like my industry, that's where sometimes I go, okay, well, maybe I should learn a little bit about politics to see how it's going to affect my industry, whether it be laws and regulations and sure. what I can practice and everything. Um, but like to my knowledge, none of that has been affected yet by a specific individual in power. Um, so like, so I just, I don't have, really have a stance on that kind of thing. As long as it's not like affecting me to help others then I'm not going to really get involved. No, and I don't think it's right for anybody to have power over somebody else in the way where we can shame or guilt you into making a decision that's manipulation. That's not education. And difference. that's not going to be a true decision either, right? That's not going to be... Decisions made under duress aren't choices. 100%. We're all pretty aware of that. Like, I remember, like, you know, kind of going back in towards health and everything, like, because this is what I wanted to talk to you about is like your coaching experience and everything. And, and we were talking about making the decisions under distress. That was actually a big problem of mine as a coach, because um, I think I mentioned this on my solo podcast one time, but my very first coach, his response time was extremely poor. It took a long, long time for him to respond. And I kind of understand now why I do understand now why, but Coming out of that, that's what sparked me to like, okay, like I'm going to do this for a living now, but I vow it. I was like, I am not going to be like that person. I am going to have adequate response times and that way, because I know how that made me feel not having that adequate response time. But what would happen instead of actually sitting down, sleeping on something or whichever, and actually thinking about it, I would provide incorrect answers to my clients. And I... Like I have one in my head right now. Like I always remember she was like, why don't you just say that before? And I literally came out. I was like, I have been prioritizing response time over response quality. And from that point on was like, okay, like this is not helping me. My business is not helping individuals move forward. And so I had to stop doing that. So like if, if something happens, I have to sit on it, you know? And like the only time that something would ever be super urgent for me and them like working together would be like, Hey, I'm going to the grocery store. What am I picking up? Sure. Even that's not urgent. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It might, they might be annoyed if I don't get back to them and they got to go back to the grocery store or something. But like, if you get your leg cut off, that's got nothing to do with me. <laughs> yeah. There's no sense of you get in a car accident. There, there's no sense of urgency on my aspect. There's sometimes like a client the other day said, could you please do a call right away? Because she had, she had to go on antibiotics and tooth abscess and she just wanted to make sure she's on the right track. I was able to accommodate and, but it wasn't really like a sense of urgency. If yeah. I hadn't have gotten to that call that night, it wouldn't have been the end of the world. Whereas a paramedic, <laughs> that is you a sense lit- of urgency. Man, there right? are some stories. I don't know if you guys want to get into them here or not, but there are some real gross stories, some funny stories. I want to hear one, but hold that thought. Yeah. I gotta be. Okay. So you're talking about paramedic stories. I do want to hear some, like I, I, I'm kind of into that whole, like you don't have to get gruesome or anything. And like, that might be very lack of empathy from me or whatever, but it's crazy. Some of the things that happens to human beings. Like I remember, um, one of my friends, I think she's a paramedic or an EMT. Can't remember. She told me about how a tractor rolled Mm. and they were finding him all over the place. 
Yeah. Because I, I don't know much about track, something, the whole combine thing or whatever. Sure, yeah. And of course, he fell into it, right? Yeah. And they're finding him all over the place. And the reason why I'm curious about this, though, is because I think it would be good for you to tell a story. Sure. Because essentially, the mental survival of you overcoming that. You know what? I have to, I have to be honest here. Like I, I did paramedics. Like I was full fledged in for a little over a year and I've seen a lot of stuff. I mean, even in rural, like, I mean, rural, sometimes it's worse in city. There's all kinds, you get dead people, you get bodies, you get blood, you get gore, you get some humor, you get all kinds of stuff. Sometimes in rural, I had to get real creative because they just didn't supply the things they needed to supply to us. Um, what do you mean? Well, I'll get into that actually in a bit okay. here. Um, but I got friends of mine, like in large city who've been like one of my friends from the, from the gym, he's been 35 years as a paramedic now, uh, 30 years probably, but he is, I mean, recently he had some events that transpired over the, over Christmas time that he's been off working in therapy for like PTSD stuff. Like when you deal with children and house fires and burns and all kinds of stuff, like it'll mess you up. I was lucky enough. I didn't have anything that really gave me PTSD. Okay. There was a lot of mess that I came across. I was, I had one call. I was literally head to toe covered in blood. I left my uniform at the hospital and wore scrubs home because I guess it was, I was un, unsalvageable. So I've had those situations, but nothing that was really traumatic. So I got very, very lucky in that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you hear some of the stories and it's like, you know, we want to talk about a, fi- a person's like physical well being and how driven it is by the mind. Like we mentioned, like I just couldn't imagine like experiencing some, like you have to be, a special person you know what i mean like i was just like so uh i was listening to a podcast earlier with this sniper guy or whatever Mm. he created the shot iq Mm. and to teach people how to shoot properly or whatever like like officers and stuff and he was talking about this story where the father had his own daughter hostage and everything and he had to kill the father and all that kind of stuff but the way he was telling the story was like it was just another tuesday yeah you know what i mean and it's like okay that's compartmentalization though well so here's how i was thinking i was like okay you would have to be a pretty sane individual to be in that profession and to wield a gun like that but for you to talk about that story i almost feel like there's something wrong with you but is there, you know what I mean? Like you're almost like a little bit crazy to be able to have that conversation or am I wrong? You know what I mean? I, I like, don't think the human brain was meant, was designed to handle trauma. You know what I mean? I don't think we were created in such a way to deal with the level of trauma we have to see. It depends on if you're looking at like creation, for example, right? As a Christian, I believe in creation. I don't believe God's original design was to have trauma and violence and war and rape and all these things across the world happening. I don't think we were designed to handle, so we compartmentalize and we block things out. And there's PTSD that develops because of your inability to cope. But some people, right? Some people are great at blocking. I'm really good at compartmentalizing. My wife hates it. And my therapist and I are working through, you know, like how to actually open up and have conversations rather than bottleneck my feelings all the time. And so we have coping mechanisms. Some people just turn that off. But I have a friend of mine. Uh, he was in the British Royal Marines for 10 years. And I forget his exact title, but he was the guy who would go out in front of his crew and he'd be checking for landmines and bombs and IEDs to make sure you're not going to, you're not, everybody's not going to blow up. Like you're responsible for their safety. And he's seen some stuff. He's had friends blow up next to him and all kinds. And he now works in uh, CBT. He's a master hypnotist, master um, uh, neurolinguistic programming and all these things. And he does a great job with it, but he talks openly about his experiences and his, his history of PTSD and the things they would do in the military just that were so absurd to any of us, but for them, it's another Tuesday, like naked bar. They go to the bar 2 AM, all the dudes just strip down and just drink nude, or they'd vomit in a glass and drink their vomit. Just ridiculous shit that would make most people sick to their stomach to think about. But because of the level that they were dealing with, it was just another thing. It just didn't matter because they were operating on such a different plane in the worst way. Desensitization. Total desensitization. That's what it was. The more ludicrous you were, the easier those other things in your day-to-day life became. Watching people die was whatever. Mm -hmm. It's mess it's 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 all coping. But the mind, back to how powerful it is, can do that. But it's not it's obviously not healthy, but it can do it. It'll do what it has to do. Yeah. And then and then like on at face value it looks like it's carp- um um you know what wow the tongue twister compartmentalizing right um but then when you look at the physiology how it's affected right it's more so in females so when you look at females who struggle with ptsd in some form of trauma 
they're guaranteed to have a hormonal disorder or a gut issue or a thyroid mm-hmm. issue. They're guaranteed. And one of the greatest threats to your physiology is unresolved trauma, right? Is that lingering in the subconscious unresolved trauma. And that's where kind of going back to where we were talking about how powerful the mind is. You could look at all these supplements. You could look at, you could have the most perfect nutrition plan, but if you're not going to face that trauma and find some way to create closure, then it's going to haunt you for the rest of your life. Right. And you're going to be battling, like, let's say somebody comes to you or I and they want to improve their health, improve their gut function, improve their strength, whatever. But they're completely ignoring or they're working out like, let's keep it very simple, like a very poor job. Like they just hate their job. Right. You're never going to get the results that you're looking for. Sorry, I shouldn't be that. I shouldn't shouldn't say never, but it's going to be a much more uphill uphill battle. battle. Right. And so um, that's it's always important to resolve that trauma. And this is why, like, I think psychedelics are becoming big here. And I actually, I was going to do a solo podcast on psychedelics and I was actually going to title it my beef with psychedelics. Um, and the reason I have beef with them is because a lot of people don't understand the mechanisms. They've just heard certain people go on or they tried them themselves and they felt really good, but they don't understand the long lasting effects of something like psychedelics. I got some people you should interview about that. If you want to dive into psychedelics and the actual science and how they work and why they work in their experience, they're, they're what I call a psychonaut, right? It's a term for them. They do them all the time. They'll, they'll like stack acid and psilocybin and all kinds. Right. But here's the thing though, right? So even with these individuals, so this is what people don't understand that, to, that once again, and we're not going to get too in depth sure. in technical terms because a lot of them, like my current demographic doesn't understand, but psychedelics are serotonin. We'll put it very simple that way. They are serotonin. So when you are like, when you're in a low spot and you think, okay, psychedelics are going to heal me. Cause that's what I see when people are like sharing to their Instagram stories. It's always like hashtag heal or something, which yes, under the right context. So like, let's get this straight before people start putting words in my mouth. I am an advocate of psychedelics. Mm-hmm. I am not, Dude. even though I want to say beef with psychedelics, it's because people don't know how to use them properly. Because what you will see is they'll go on Instagram, they'll see someone's story, hashtag heal, whatever it may be. And the next thing you know, you don't really hear from them again. And they don't talk about mushrooms anymore. And they still have the same issues that they initially had. Because what happens is, is your body, I've said this a thousand times, your body is a miraculous meat suit, Okay. Even if you think it's doing dumb things, I'd get a t-shirt that says I'm a miraculous. <laughs> <laughs> so you take this serotonin in the form of a psychedelic to which improves tons of aspects. Think of serotonin as the alternator on your car. It's going to recharge your batteries. Mm-hmm. So this is how it affects every other neurotransmitter, right? And this is why you get the benefits from psychedelics. But what happens is you, your body will retaliate, especially in high dosages, even chronic low dosages, even chronic microdosing for most individuals, not all. Because what happens now is this surge of serotonin that the body realizes, okay, look, like it's not specifically saying this, but to make sense of the conversation, you have some pretty compromised guts. You really should not be making this much serotonin. So why is there so much serotonin? That doesn't make sense. Mm. So let's start increasing monooxidize which is an enzyme that breaks down serotonin and let's start down regulating receptors in the brain because this isn't natural. This isn't right. Mm. And this will happen either in a the huge body dose. not in homeostasis. Anyone who's done MDMA and they get the blues, that's what that is. Anyone who has done antidepressants, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So like to get a little bit of education for people, um, you have your neurons, you have your post and pre neuron. Okay. They're not actually touching. Mm -hmm. You have what's known as the synaptic cleft in between them. And so let's say that post neuron is calling for an action It's calling for serotonin. So the pre neuron is going to use a specific substrate to create that serotonin molecule, which is then going to go into the synaptic cleft. Once it's in the synaptic space between the two neurons, Yes, the space between the two neurons. And once it's in there, it's going to have three potential fates. There might be more, but three main fates. It's either going to get reuptaked back into the pre neuron, it's going to get broken down by MAO, monooxidized uh, enzyme, or it's going to get taken up into the post neuron, which then becomes a pre neuron and makes its way down the chain and goes where it needs to go. Okay. So when you look at antidepressants, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, that's exactly what they're doing. They're blocking it from being reuptake. So it increases the chances of that serotonin going Traveling. to the post neuron. But here's the thing you are not suffering from low serotonin because you are not taking 
antidepressants. You are not making enough. And the body knows this. So this is why you look at like when people come cold turkey, the suicide rate, you look at people don't really feel any better, the sex drive loss, you name it, right? Yes, they can put you into a more neutral ground where you kind of don't care. Like you're not like in a bad state, but also not in a good state. And some people are, right? And some people are fine living like that. But the same thing happens with psychedelics. The same things. I have done them and... I, I totally believe in microdosing, but as someone that has an addictive personality who's like, oh, what's another little microdose going to hurt? It's important to understand too that what you do today might not affect you for three weeks. That's mm. what a lot of people don't understand as well. And it's Things hard to make those correlations after that. 100%. It's too long gone. You talk about inflammation with food. That's why the elimination diet can be very difficult because it can take three to four days for that inflammation to come on from that specific food unless it is a very high inflammatory food, right? Sure. Um, But so that's the thing with psychedelics. And that's where like people will be flying high if they're always doing them. But as soon as you run out or can no longer afford to do them or whatever, and the potential of those uh, um, uh, receptors down regulating and that increase in that enzyme to break them down, Mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you're breaking down way too much serotonin and you're not taking a lot up into the brain. You're reuptaking a lot and there comes your depression. And this is why you see people that are really promoting psychedelics and then all of a sudden it stops. Now, I do believe cause where, where, why we're talking about this, we're talking about trauma, PTSD and unresolved issues because a bolus dose of psychedelics can help you confront that trauma. Mm. It can help you confront that trauma. And I do like microdosing and gut protocols because your gut is going to be in shambles. So it's going to produce less neurotransmitters. So by taking an exogenous source, you can get through a gut protocol without hating life. Sure. Right. But within the proper context used under proper supervision, and I'm not talking like a shaman in this instance, <laughs> talking to someone such as myself who is educated right. and experienced. Um, but when you're talking like the big, like you talk DMT, it gets a fight laughed at because of Joe Rogan. Yeah. I think Joe Rogan's a freaking idiot, right? Yeah. He gets some amazing guests though. Um, but he's not wrong about DMT and what it could do for the human psyche, right? Ayahuasca. These things aren't wrong. They actually believe that our species, the reasons our brains are so huge compared to the latter Mm. species is because of psychedelics. There's a lot of evidence starting to point towards that. Mm. Like the Greeks, they're finding finding psychedelics in all their vases of wine and everything. Like there's a lot of this stuff going on. But it's such a taboo subject. It's it's slowly not becoming one because they're legalizing in places. Mm. Like I heard you can do cocaine in BC now. Um, but oh, yeah. Well, BC is a cesspool now. I mean, they, they've, they've decriminalized all the drugs and heroin runs rampant in the streets and there's Holy people shit, passed right. out. Oh yeah, laying, I forget, the, there's, a, there's a particular street in uh, Vancouver and heroin is just a huge issue, overdoses constantly. So they did decriminalize but it's been a huge problem. BC, the death rate and crime rate, everything's shot through the roof. It's not been a good thing. So what, what what's the tactic for that? What's the theory? Why would they legalize this stuff? Uh, there have been some countries that had like decriminalized, like a lot of South American countries. I, I don't, I don't want to say which ones because I don't want to be misquoted on that, but there have been some that decriminalized even like methamphetamine. And they found that, you know, things were okay when things just like people, right? Don't press the big red button. Well, I'm going to press the big red button. Well, it's illegal. You know, I'm going to do it. And so the problem is See, though, that's what I thought it was the reverse psychology. They, that's what they were trying to pull here, but yeah. it did not work. It completely backfired. Now it's decriminalized criminalized now it's just run rampant now it's a business now it's capitalism i mean what's stopping somebody from starting a website and selling heroin now to bc residents from bc it's decriminalized you can just buy it on the street now so the question is what doors does that open for people and with human nature again we have an inclination especially over the last few years as a our beloved Fuhrer and uh, country leader has completely run up debt and poverty and inflation and all kinds of stuff. People's quality of life has decreased. So what do they turn to? Things that make them feel good. Heroin, one of the most addictive substances on earth, right? Shoots that feel good through the roof. Feel more good. Feel more good. Take more. Feel more good. Increase the frequency. Increase the dose. Miss dose. Overdose. Right. So all kinds of things start to stack on top of themselves. And I think the idea was decriminalize reverse psychology or we have what we have now, which is an increased rate in crime, increased rate in overdoses and sickness and illness. Could it also be because, so like this is, I had a, someone, one of my clients the other day, cause we talked about microdosing psychedelics to get her through a gut protocol. Sure. And, um, and she, she's like, well, how do you microdose LSD? Like, how do you microdose a tab? I said, well, you put it in alcohol. Don't listen to that people. Um, yeah, don't, don't so, do these things. And I said, but you, 
you never truly truly know the actual the, the tell you 20 mcg in this tab and it's it's not 20 mcg right and so i'm like this is why you do something like this the way that i was kind of explaining so you can properly dose it so but then she made a comment she's like yeah that's what my one friend taught me is that you never truly know what the dosage is i said yeah you also don't know what toilet bowl it was made on Right. And I th wonder if that's why they're also legalizing it, because then there's going to be like, you know, like, or maybe there will be, uh, what, what should I call them? Like the, with, with marijuana right now, they have companies, they have places sure, that government grow regulated. And, go, yeah. Government regulated. But government so weed is the worst fentanyl. weed there is. I don't smoke a lot of weed. I used to a lot, but when I did the stuff I bought street illegal weed that I bought from <laughs> suppliers, I started dealing drugs when I was like 15. Interesting story there. But anyways, so that weed is much cleaner and better, has higher concentrations, better THC. Now, again, dysregulation, people start spraying it with Windex and shit to get people super high. So that's what I mean. So that's right. why I think that maybe that's why the government wants to step in. Every government weed I've ordered had mold in it. Yeah, Every time. I'm talking like five out of five. Hmm. So what are you really getting, right? What is the regu regulation doesn't mean shit when it's incompetence who's regulating it in the first place. Yeah. Right? I trust I feel like your body dealer. in the right condition though could handle mold more than it could handle Windex, but <laughs> <laughs> so. I think I'd like to avoid both. <laughs> yeah. But I don't, I just, I never understood like I, my only thought process um, at quick assumption without any research, which is what I hate, but I was just thinking <laughs> the thing we we're reverse. talking about not doing yet. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think was reverse psychology for that. But, but anyway, so like back to the whole psychedelics and the trauma and everything. Yeah. There's lots of research showing it's an extremely viable tool for that. It's just, you never hear the long term stuff. And there's a reason for it. Cause one, they don't do studies long enough cause they don't, it's such, it goes back to where I was talking about the Chinese medicine where I got so excited about it and started mm. implementing it right away rather than like kind of sitting on it. It's the same thing with the research that they're finding on psychedelics. It's so promising and it's so exciting to have a veteran who is living their worst life because of trauma to overcome that with one dosage of psychedelics. Like a macro dose on their self-assessment scores for up to six months they're saying they're improved. Exactly. What happens after? I don't know. Exactly because we're kind of stopping there because we're like wow this is amazing and we need to do this and once again too in no way shape or form because people really love to put words in your mouth. Am I saying psychedelics are bad or am I saying that they're good? I'm saying things can be effective in the proper context under the proper sure. supervision. Ibuprofen has its uses. It's been shown to actually increase muscle mass. It's been shown to decrease muscle mass. So it's been you, shown you know to destroy it increases, your gut and liver. You know how it increases muscle mass? No. Because... As we know, for hypertrophy, to build up of the muscle, you need that inflammatory response. You have to hit a specific threshold for the body to signal the process to build that muscle tissue, sure. right? If you are so inflamed, let's say the threshold is here because you are so inflamed, you're only getting here, you take ibuprofen, it brings that threshold down so you can get that signal. So it's actually been shown in research to help elderly individuals build muscle using ibuprofen. Right. Long term, so it, it messes me everything else it's up. It's inflammatory, yeah, mess your liver, mess your gut, yeah. mess your everything. Uh, but case in Boswell point- Boswell right? Use What's that, that? Boswellia Serrata, use that instead. Mm, interesting. I'll yeah. write it down. Yeah. So I guess the, the moral of the story there is everything in context and improper dosing with proper research, right? Anything's going to be bad. Sugar, not going to kill you, but it can. So this is what I say. Like, we could talk about sugar for sure, but like, let's go back to like where you're saying moderate dosage properly done. It's always re important to remember though, like we'll say psychedelics again, mm -hmm. you are not depressed because you're not doing psychedelics. That's what people need to understand. So you can't just do psychedelics and not be depressed. There's other mechanisms. It's addressing the symptom. Depression oh, yeah. in this example is, is a symptom. Trauma is the root cause leading to depression. And yes, the psychedelic can confront the trauma, but then you have to look at what else did the trauma create? What other environment did it create? As mentioned, especially in females. Gut issues. That's where my gut issues came from. Females, they cause gut issues. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually, yes. Uh, <laughs> trauma. <laughs> so, right. And, and that's important to understand. So for the average person, like let's take away from the context of like veterans and, and paramedics and stuff that have experienced like true, true trauma and just the average person that lives a, <clears throat> we'll say a stressful life. Your depression is not from the fact that you're not doing psychedelics, right? So psychedelics is not the long-term solution. It could be the acute solution. And this is not, don't just, don't focus on just psychedelics. I'm talking anything. I'm just using the word psychedelics. We can talk ibuprofen. We can talk supplements. We can talk certain diet protocols, right? 
you are not that way because you're not taking a specific supplement or a specific uh, substance or whatever. There's something else. But acutely, as you mentioned, like ibuprofen, for example, there is a time and a place for everything. It's just like medication. It's just, even though I was just talking about antidepressants, there is a time and a place. If you are so low on yourself that you cannot begin a program to get yourself out of that depression, all the power to you to use SSRIs. Right. It's the chronic exposure to things. It's no different than a chronic exposure to a quote unquote healthy diet Mm -hmm. of carbs, vegetables and meat over time that can mess you up. Should maybe do keto should maybe do carnivore for a bit should maybe do a little fasting, switch things up, give your body a break from responding to the same genes all the time. Right. So. I think that's really, really important for people to understand because we get very hung up. I've done it lots, man. My mm-hmm. clients can attest to it. I feel really bad for my clients. You know, supplements was a big one. I would, I would take a supplement. I would feel great on this supplement for about a week, and then it would go back to feeling like crap. Sure. But I would feel so great initially that I'm like, "You got this symptom. I got this symptom. You got to take this supplement." Yep. <laughs> you know what I mean? A and lot of people doing that. I feel good, therefore you will, therefore do it. Yeah. And theoretically, it might work just as it did for me for a week. And then you go right back. This is why this is why I'm so big on gut health, because you look at the majority like, you know, you mentioned stuff about like your acne or whatever. Yep. Right. It may not be the direct cause, but what it has caused with in your physiology could be leading to that. So we could look at everything outside the gut, kind of alleviate some of that acne. But then all of a sudden that gut health starts going back out and affecting all those other systems. Of the and physiology I know my candida is elevated like four times the, the, the threshold amount. Right. So like my, what are your cravings like, um, honestly, not that bad. I do have a proclivity to sweets for sure, but it's not the worst. Like I don't crave alcohol. I don't really crave. I like the chewy of bread. It is not the carb that I crave. Um, I'm okay just eating like basic berries, like blueberries, blackberries, raspberries. It's, it's more, it's different for women. It's more, predominant in women but candida can alter your brain chemistry to crave sugar oh for sure because that's what it'll, it'll feed it yeah, it'll feed it the candida, the right and so that's where a lot of people like i get like gi maps back and before i say a word about anything that's on there go you get a lot of cravings like i have really bad cravings yeah. and they have higher levels of candida and so that's like you can correlate the two usually 10 times out of 10 yeah and so oh, for sure and I, I think because I know like candida being more of like a fungal situation at this point, right? When it overgrows, turns into its hyphal form, creates this webbing in the gut and it just buries in there. I can surmise that there's probably infection. There's all kinds of inflammation. My gut's going to be a mess. My lip's going to be a mess. There's going to be all kinds of issues. going to be shooting shit throughout my entire body. And I can correlate if I eat like a carb heavy meal, I'm talking like an entire loaf of sourdough. I will get more acne. I'm bringing up your GI map here. Oh, sure. So I will it. say, so I did want to say that I was going to save it for the review, <clears throat> but I'm going to say it now as when I look at your GI map, the candida is honestly the least of the worries. Oh yeah. Getting so like remember how I talked about or? people really focusing on one thing. We've really, really, you need some candida. Of That's course. what people understand, right? Candida, Which, candida in a natural amount, mine is super physiological. Yeah, true, right? But as mentioned, which email did you send it to? The uh, one, number one? Probably one? number one. So I, I'm looking at my GI map, for example. I know there's elevated levels of strep and staph, which to my understanding can be covered by which the- Which mean nothing. Right. So they're covered by the biofilm. Of sure. And strap. They'll be covered by the biofilm from my candida. Candida is super high. There's some H. pylori in So there. every bacteria will have biofilm. Though. Sure. I know my pancreas isn't working right and my body's not using fibers properly. All that so, shit's throw off the charts. Okay. So you want to know the one that is, is the one that's the most concerning- out of teach all of me, this, this teach me everything is going to be the autoimmune related bacteria, right? That's going to be the most concerning. Which ones? I don't have it in front of me. Which ones are those? That is your Prevolta SPP. Okay. Um, or sorry, Prevotella. And once again, though, a lot of your markers are not super high. Your commensal overgrowth, um, your disflow, of, your disflow of brio, that one is a little high. But like when you look at your streptococcus and you look at your staphylococcus, those ones are usually due to stomach acid and everyone has those. I, I do have an underactive stomach. And yeah. Again, there's, and you can pylori. see that. Yes. Your pancreatic function, uh, is down, right. Um, 
So it's via elastase, yes? Yeah, so yeah. which is going to be HCL, pancreatic enzymes, you name it. Your secretory IgA is also low. as well, I believe, is fiber, is it For Uh So that's going to be more of like a balanced ratio. For like Achilles? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. that's going to be more of a balanced ratio of because you're leading towards SIBO, Right, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. What indicators is there? Methane in there? Like, what are you finding? You just got high normal commensal flora. Oh, so just high normal commensal flora. And you have four or more markers in your opportunistic overgrowth, which is grounds for SIBO. (laughs) Perfect. Right. So, and this is why a GI map is so important. Your H. pylori is not super, super high, but the thing is, is H. pylori can systemically affect everything. So it can exacerbate your other bacterial overgrowth mm. right is what can happen and so that is one where um i do really like to do make that a focus because of the systemic effects that affect your pancreatic function um the only thing about this I, we talked about this too is like they're undetect there's no detection of parasites and stuff but like your your immune function is slightly leaning towards there might be um a parasite but with what protocol we'll use is going to target that anyways. So it's not something like I'd be super, super concerned about. Good thing I waited. I was just going to go buy like bottles of lumbrokinase, strept, uh, uh, streptokinase. When I got my first GI map that I took, I did the review with Nutrition Dynamic. And Stephanie Wagner, I think, I can't remember her name. Smart woman, she is. Hope this is a good call out, not a slam. <laughs> have to mute her name. Kind of is. Disparagement. Because... <laughs> No, it's not a slam. I take that back. I apologize. It's not a slam. It's just, it's me, once again, my addictive tendencies and just out of so much desperation to heal, my initial investment into the supplements, I think was $1,200 because I bought a ridiculous amount of supplements. Sure. Right? And so I'm just piggybacking off of what you said. You were going to go and buy this and this and this and this. Where I'm at now... I would only needed three mm. instead of like the 15. This is why I didn't buy anything. And I waited to see you. <laughs> right. I, I don't trust anybody except for you. <laughs> and so it's it, like, when you look at, this is what I mean. This is the problem with testing. Okay. It is an extremely valuable tool for the individual that is going to help you heal. Or if you're that individual, it's an extremely valuable tool. It is so bad for the individual that needs to heal though, because then they see these test results and they start going, oh my God, that's why I have this symptom. And that's why I have that symptom. And it creates this stress, whether they realize it or not, it could be subconscious stress. And then they start to exacerbate those issues because I'll get individuals who will look 12 months pregnant and they'll have an, I know they have an insane overgrowth, but they're almost fine because they're not thinking about it. They're not affected by it. They're complacent. 12 months is so many months to be pregnant. (laughs) (laughs) So that's one of the complications with testing. I've experienced it myself. None of my GI maps did it to me. My mycotoxin test, my Mm. mycotoxin test depressed the hell out of me because when you read into it, Okay, you read into it and it's like brain deterioration, kidney deterioration, and those have always been my fear. My mind, I'm at the point in my life now, and I've mentioned this before, that, okay, yeah, sure, having muscles is nice. It kind of, you know, your body's your billboard in this industry and stuff. It's this. It's this. I could care less about diarrhea and gas if this was running 100%, but that diarrhea and gas ain't going to make this run 100%. It's my mind. So when I read that this creates, like causes brain deterioration and everything, I went into this deep hole and I hated sure. life and I hated everything. I had a mentor call and he's like, this is nothing. <laughs> Send me some links, 100% reversible if there is even any brain damage. Right. Right. And so this is where testing can be very bad for people, but also a very amazing tool. It's no different than checking your weight every day or checking your weight ever kind of thing. It's a valuable tool for the individual that's helping you, but for yourself, it could be extremely detrimental. And that's where, but there is the opposite spectrum. When I got my first GI map and literally almost every marker was red, I was like, there's so much hope for me. If I am doing this okay in life right now, can you imagine what it's going to be like when I begin to heal? Mm. Can you imagine how 
productive I'm going to be, how intelligent I'm going to be, how my emotions are going to be in check, how strong I'm going to be in the gym, how much like more focus and attention and time I can invest into myself, into my business. Like there was so much I'm hope. so excited to be able to focus. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm taking a lot of shit. Like I take NAC 500 morning and night. I'm taking Tudka. I'm taking l -theanine. I probably take 1500 milligrams of 2000 of l a day. I got my magnesium. It's, inflammation. it's great for my inner inflammation. Um, I've got another one it's got these, these these bunch of medicinal mushrooms and lines meaning all this shit and i'm functioning pretty good i feel great i'm on an acetal nine ten grams a day like i feel great nine ten you don't shit your pants no i feel great i guess now. you probably you tolerate you try did you try tate up to it uh oh yeah 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 because yeah, 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 the yeah, first okay. time i took it i took a tablespoon like it told me on the back and, and I, I i shit like 10 times yeah, yeah, in a row yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so i went down to like a quarter of a of a quarter of a quarter yeah, of a teaspoon you, yeah. and i started sprinkling and now over about so why six eight months an neurological so what a lot of people don't understand with inositol is inositol does help replenish serotonin uh, receptors mm. in the brain. For me, with the ADHD, I found it very beneficial. Um, I wanted to it'll improve serotonin, which will improve other neurotransmitters. Correct. So when you talk ADHD, so this this can be a touchy subject for some people. And the reason being it can be a touchy subject is because once you get labeled goes back to that diabetes isn't curable, so on and so forth, or people want to use it as their crutch. Well, it becomes an identity as well. Yeah, so that's exactly it. It becomes an identity, it, and it then you try me. to tell them otherwise, and they just don't like it, right? They want to go on medication and all this kind of stuff. I got depressed when I got diagnosed. Right, and so this, 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 I'll try to make this, in, I'm not, I'm not trying to downplay ADHD, but I'll try to make this sure. as simple as possible. When you look at ADHD or ADD, it's a focus issue. Okay. And when you look at the medical community and they're looking at things like Adderall, Dexedrine, Ritalin, a lot of those will target dobergenic pathways. It's, it's okay? pharmaceutical grade meth. Right. So yeah. they improve your levels of dopamine, which dopamine is your get shit done. Focus, motivation. Yeah. So it's not, don't look at it as focus though. Okay. Mm. It motivates you to be more focused which is going to improve focus, but it's not the actual focus aspect, mm. right? Because most people who do those medications are getting labor done. I, I see a lot of people take them so they can clean their home. Mm. They can get their laundry folded. They can do the dishes. Not a lot of them are actually doing it for school. <clears throat> now, yes, it will affect that mechanism, but because it's just more motivated to actually sit there and be like, okay, teacher, Tell me what to do. I'm yeah. listening now. But when we talk about ADD, we have to look at acetylcholine is what we have to do. And acetylcholine is your learning and focus neurotransmitter. Your choline is already very scarce in the diet. And then now you talk about TikTok, you talk about Instagram, you talk about Facebook. Quick, quick, quick. quick. It's a dopamine factory, man. Right? But you need that acetylcholine. It's what regulates your brain waves. So you're burning through acetylcholine at the same rate, if not more than you are dopamine. So now dopamine is your engine. It's your horsepower. Acetylcholine is your accelerator. Mm. So you now have a big engine with a tiny little accelerator. You can't control that engine. That's where addiction comes from, right? And so when you look at how does gut health create ADD because of lack of neurotransmitter production and also detoxification, clearance of neurotransmitters, catecholamine, stress hormones, burning through your choline, poor methylation, not building enough choline. You look at the PEMT gene, which is responsible for building phosphatidylcholine, majority of the population, it's shot, it's slow. So it's not, you're not building adequate levels. There are interesting studies around ADHD in all kinds of different facets. And one of the things that they've studied recently, relatively, is that ADHD is actually a split between the knowing what to do and the actual doing of what you're supposed to do. And so instead of being an attention deficit disorder, it's an intention deficit disorder. So you have, you, you know what you should be doing and the intention is maybe there, but the actual getting up and doing gets completely lost, which is really interesting when you start to split it that way. That's why but they target goes, dopamine pathways with medication. Right. And so it goes back to what are we patching in order to get that done? But mm -hmm. again, if it's more about acetylcholine, not the dopamine, and we're just hitting dopamine, we're always lacking something. When I was on medication, I was taking Vyvanse. And they were up to, I was up to 50 milligrams a day. Max dose is 70. Max, yeah. max, max. And I was up to 50. And I was, I was great, man. I was eight, 10 hours, 12 hours a day. I could sit and I just work. 
nonstop, mm-hmm. right? I felt like a tweaker just like digging in the ground. It's like, I'm going to find something good. And so I was working nonstop. The problem is eventually it started to last eight hours and then six hours. And I think Remember I capped around six SSRIs? hours. That's exactly same the same. <laughs> and guess what happened to me after it was coming down? Instead of just cruising down and going to bed, I started having mood swings, manic episodes, depression. I was all over the map, man. Like I was, I had suicidal thoughts. It drove me nuts. I came, I stopped cold turkey. And <laughs> this, I can't take it anymore. Mm-hmm. It was driving me crazy. It was ruining my relationship. I couldn't get anything done. I was jittery. If I was working and I got disrupted, I was irritable. It, just, it wasn't good. It was a bad, bad thing, man. Yeah. And once, once again, too, it's the body responding to that because it knows it's, and let's not forget too, like, never mind that actual like aspect of everything. Like I just said about the SSRIs and what sure. we just talked about. It's also medications will drastically affect methylation, mm. right? And for those that don't know methylation to keep it very simple is the process of turning things on and off. Now, so what that, so if you have poor methylation, you could be turning on depression rather than off. Mm. If you have poor methylation, a supplement might not work for you because you're not turning on the proper enzymes to make that supplement effective, right? You're not turning on specific genes, uh, your GST and GPX to create glutathione, right? For example, so then your antioxidant production is very poor. You're not turning on melatonin, right? So that's kind of like what methylation is. And medications can really disrupt the methylation process, Mm -hmm. right? And think of methylation as your car, parts of your car. Right. And so you got the folate cycle, which is going to be your starter the methionine cycle, which is going to be look at it as your drivetrain, let's say, then you got your SAM cycle. That's going to be like your tires, for example. And then you got, you know, your homocysteine cycle, which say is your, um, what comes out? <laughs> I messed it up. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Methionine cycle is your engine. SAM cycle is your drivetrain. And then the methionine cycle or the uh, homocysteine cycle is your tires. Think of it like that. So Once everything's got to your rotate. Gut, your brain is going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> everything's got to rotate accordingly. Otherwise your car's not going to move. Sure. Right. And that's what a majority of the population is struggling with is poor methylation. I believe it's up to 60% of the population 60%. struggles with methylation. I could be, don't quote me, but no, I believe the last that I saw was 60%. Yeah. Mine shot. Like when I took my genetics, so I took it through strategy like my MTHFR is slow, my PMT is slow, my GPX, GST is slow, mm-hmm. so antioxidant production. I don't think anything was optimal. <laughs> so, Speaking of antioxidants, I've drank like four liters of beet juice last week. I've been craving it like crazy. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm, that's interesting. Mm, I wonder why, right? I'm like, how are your veins? <laughs> All that nitric oxide. It's so vascular, bro. <laughs> yeah. You should see my everythings. <laughs> no, oh, yeah. That's good. Yeah, it's hmm. been wonderful. I uh, I mix it with lemons and carrots. I put a little bit of uh, some ginger and then just for some flavor, I put some apple and orange in there. And uh, it's just like, I'll drink a liter of beet juice and I'll go really? back and get a, I'll fill it back up. How's your bowel movements? All red? Actually, it scared me because they're straight purple, right? They're like not not red. They're purple. I'm peeing red and I'm I'm shitting purple. <laughs> and at first, it took me a minute because the first beet juice leader I drank, I was like, oh my god, like because I work in colitis, right? So naturally, I'm freaking out. But it took me a second. I clicked back in. I'm like, it's yeah. just it's beets. Yeah, yeah. Very, and that, that's very that's gonna be due your due to your permeability as well. Then again, too, I think even with someone with like extreme permeability, I'm sure some of the dye of beet juice would eventually make its way through. Um, but yeah, when you notice that, it's gonna be due to like your mucosal lining and stuff because it is going to be compromised right now. Be, yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, so that makes a lot of sense there. <laughs> when, <laughs> I've done that too. Like when my, when my guts are in shambles and you, you eat something and you're like, this doesn't make any sense. And then you're like, Oh yeah, I guess yeah. this is coming right through the thing with like my guts. Um, so for example, like I would use something like candy backed in AR, so oregano oil. And most people are familiar with the pungent smell of oregano oil. Smell like an Italian pasta restaurant. Right. And I would take a pill and like have a bowel movement like two hours later and I could already smell that AR pill. That's how fast my transit time was. So that's just my body saying, Hey, we got to get things out of here. So the transit time was like significantly expedited, right? And now with that being said, like candy back in AR is in terracotta, it's designed to get lower down, but still sure. the fact that within that same, you know, set of hours that you would smell it, it was like, so that's right. There's a huge indicator. It's like, all right, you've got some big issues going on that you really need to address here because that's like, wild. otherwise a lot of permeability <laughs> issues. So, Man. so with everywhere you're at in life, you said you musician, so you want to teach people and everything 10 years from now, where do you think you're going to be? Education, teaching people to do what I do and venture capitalism. 
that $400 million in ideas and working on a new idea right now. And it's a big one and it's a good one and it's viable and it's amazing. And I'm working on it. I've got some investors who are interested. They want to see new prototypes, but I got a fella. He's like, I'll give you a hundred grand if I like it. And so I'm going to take that to a firm in LA who basically takes it from a napkin idea all the way up to like production. And their lead engineer that they work on there, his name's Wes Cross. He built the Batmobiles for the Christian Bale Batman movies. <laughs> really? yeah. So they're pretty serious dudes. That's cool. And uh, anyway, so I got this idea I'm working on and that's where I want to go. I want to create. And for me, I do okay financially. I got a business and I work, I work my ass off. I work 80 hours a week plus and all kinds. I got different revenue streams I'm building up. So I do okay. I'm not a millionaire. I would like to be. But for me, I can comfortably live on a fraction of what I, what I make and then use the rest for me. Like really truly, I'm going to sound like one of those like virtue signaling assholes. I want to give it away. I want to have enough money that I don't know what to do with so I can just give it away. I've got a huge heart for human trafficking. I want to help rescue women and children. And I want to give to, there's a, a, another charity I've been working with called Lighthouse Voyage. And what they do is they actually build like housing and schools and all kinds of stuff in these communities to rescue and bring these women and children in who have been trafficked. And in India, this is where they work prim primarily, a lot of children are trafficked by their parents. They got eight kids, they sell one because they need to feed the other seven, right? It's wild. And so if we can get in there and help these people, like uh, church I go to, they they do a lot of like they do a lot of fundraising and a lot of a uh, lot of giving. Very generous church, uh, but they raised I forget how many hundreds of thousands of dollars. Cost thirty grand. They built an entire school in Pakistan for thirty grand, whole school for like two hundred kids or something. Holy yeah, the money goes of or maybe it was fourteen grand. It was like a shockingly low amount. Even about thirty grand, <laughs> right? Exactly, and it just over here it would cost us what a million dollars to build a school, and so the amount of money that you actually need to make this massive impact in the world is really not that big. We just don't have enough people doing it. And you get other other federations like uh, United Way who have been actually connected to in small circles have been accused of trafficking and accused of embezzlement and thievery and all kinds of stuff where you think you're giving to organizations who are helping, but they're just as corrupt as the people who are corruption you're trying to fix. And so it's a really wild system we're in. And I realize the whole world is just going to shit and I can never change it, but I want to impact it as best I can. Okay. You know? What happened to the musician? <laughs> oh, about that. Yeah. That's just a passion. Um, so that's going to be a hobby 10 years from now. I, I think so, man. I don't know. I'd love to do music professionally, but uh, I've never seen myself as a professional musician. I'm not Ariana Grande. I'm not that cute. But at the end of the day, if, if I get to a point where music makes me money, hell yeah. Right now, yeah. it's a fulfillment. It's where the money is. Yeah. Or... It's a joy and fulfillment hobby. And I, I really, I said this to my wife the other day. I was like, and I started this when I was like 10 years old at the same, like the same effort I'm putting into it now. I said, I'd be, I'm, I'm sure I'd be very well known. I'll, I'll play you my song. My first song I've ever written and composed top to bottom. And it's excellent. I'm a little biased, but here's the thing. <laughs> yeah, I know, listen, I'd love to see what Sean would say. Cause he picks things apart right? so much. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> I listen to my own music in the car. I don't produce I don't, shit I hate. I, well, I like what my music. we call that? Narcissism? No, no. To hell with that, right? That's, I make good music and I make it because I think it sounds proud good. Proud of yourself, right? Yeah. And that's, it's a bit yeah. of a boost, but I listen to music I like and I like my music, so yeah, I'm going to listen to it. That's that's to be proud and confident in yourself and, yeah. and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Nah, nah screw the haters. Yeah, right? Yeah. So if there was, let's, let's be this lame and ask, are there any regrets? My entire life? Yeah. Many. What would you say is your biggest... My biggest, I'm not actually willing to put on a public platform. Fair enough. Um, yet. One day, maybe. But just for the preservation of like certain relationships and stuff, it's just not a wise idea. Um, outside of that, man, I honestly, I don't know. I, I know which ones are big ones for me, just due to like personal choices and stuff that I've done. Um, but outside of that. You don't think they shaped I, you? Everything has shaped me, which is why I don't think I regret things, okay. you know, like I remember That's shoplifting and dealing drugs and all kinds of stuff, but it made me who I am, mm -hmm. right? Were there some bad choices that got me into trouble? Yeah. Have I done stuff that maybe I got my ass kicked for? I got my head stomped off a curb? Sure. Right. Those things suck, but they made me who I am. So I don't regret them by themselves. Um, but there are some things in my life I do regret. They've made me, they've shaped who I am but it's still recent enough over the last, say, five, eight, ten years that there's still repercussions happening from those choices. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so those are things that one day 
um, I'd like to like fully process and work through and it no longer be a regret. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's important that we learn the whole cliche, learn from your mistakes or whatever. And that understand, like you said, uh, in, in your, um, experience that God has his hand in everything kind of deal. And I do believe, yeah, like if you're looking back at something and you're like, Oh, I wish I hadn't done that. Once again, that's focusing on isolating out one thing rather than looking at, you know, okay, maybe this is what it did for me. This is what it, you know, There's this is what same. came to fruition from it. Right? Yeah. A lot of people will say everything happens for a reason. I don't believe so. I believe bad shit happens just because it happens, mm -hmm. but I but believe that's the reason that's the, yeah, <laughs> I guess <laughs> I, I believe God will use everything for good. He can and always has. And I've seen some really amazing. I used to hate the church. I used to hate God. I used to hate anything that even remotely resembled religion, spirituality, faith, any of it. And I had some really radical only can be explained as supernatural situations happen. And I'm like, okay, like God's real. I've literally been like, prove to me. And then boom, I'm like, okay, I'm wrong. I'm an idiot. You're right. You're there. Don't smite me, almighty smiter, you know? Uh, but there's been some really amazing stuff. And so that's sort of where I've come to now. And and I want to keep leaning into that. And that's uh, a big part of where I see the rest of my life happening, man. It's just a different direction, better than what it's been. Nice, man. Glad to hear that. That's awesome. Yeah, like I said, I can't wait to start working on your guts here and uh get that sorted out and everything um but <laughs> this this podcast is random as hell um, it's, it's also but, very long i could be here for like two hours i don't think it's quite been two hours it's, 11, it's after 11 30 it's i it's, got here after nine <laughs> this is what i'm looking for though like out of individuals like out of my guests like you know it's like you were messaging me prior like do you have things prepped or whatever and, and i was taught from somebody who does have a podcast that he was like don't do that because then you create these expectations and that's what happened to me with like i feel matthew and i did very well i can't wait to have him on again with the experience that i've collected or whatever which will be down the road and same with logan mm -hmm. um i think you know we have so much more that we could talk about same with you and i we could probably go on forever um but with them i was scripted per mm -hmm. se i went in and but he told me this prior to my first ever guest right. so i had the ipad ready in case i had like a mental block or something like sure. that i got bullet points i might like to segue into right you but that's why i also say to you okay be prepared to talk about xyz but reality could i have written out everything we talked about today hell no yeah. right you know, first of all, there's not enough, like I'll be, I'll just, I don't mean this in a bad way, but there's not enough to research you about, no. right? Like go through your Instagram, go through your website. And it's a lot of what you do now. I don't have an autobiography but written. Exactly. <laughs> Would have never been talked about the paramedic situation, about your history and all these kind of things and your stance on, you know, some of the things that we talked about. And so that's why it's kind of like, okay, you know, I want to talk about random things. Now we are in the same profession though. If you had come in from a completely different profession, then maybe it would be solely focused on that profession, mm. right? But, you know, we could talk about the stuff that we do every day, all day, but we already do that kind of stuff. So it's yeah. nice to have a conversation with somebody and like, as I mentioned, learn who people are because it helps me yeah. understand the human being a little more each and every time that I learn more about individuals and just like the why we do things and where they come from and to just that understanding helps me feel better about who i am when i'm involved with certain people right because for example like you know if someone acts a certain way like we talk about all oh, this person's crazy it's like well why are they crazy yeah. what was done to make this individual crazy and if we don't know that then you kind of don't know how to handle that love that so when you start to learn these people it's okay well this individual has been neglected their entire life so this is why they're extremely needy like my foster dog right now right like not saying she has been but there's maybe some signs of that yeah so instead of just going oh this dog is so needy it's like why are you so needy there's always a reason why are you so needy right and okay. so no i i appreciate you coming here man and i thank That's you great. for your time I appreciate it and i really well, enjoyed this and before uh, we uh before we wrap up officially we made a promise about some stories now I got, oh you gotta tell me why i got i got three branches we can go okay tell me we can go down some aspects where I worked in rural and we had to get very creative because okay. not a lot of the ambulance supply just wasn't proper. So we had to get very creative at times. And there's also you're in rural shit happens. There's number one, number two, there's some really like not gro like gory, but very bloody stories I can talk about where I was covered head to toe in blood or just some ridiculous, funny, gross stuff. That's tough. I'm thinking almost funny. <laughs> go that route i'm thinking almost right. funny yeah so 
Uh, my partner at the time name was Justin. We actually went to school together. Justin and I graduated from the same college. We moved out to Newfoundland together. We worked in the same base. We actually lived in the same house. So out in the rural Newfoundland, we're working for an ambulance service called Fewer's Ambulance. Now, Fewer's Ambulance, I can disparage them because it was just the worst experience ever. But we lived in a house. Again, it's rural. It is what it is. And we lived on the base. We are on call all the time. We lived there seven days on, we'd be on call 24 hours a day, have two days off, seven days on, then five days off. And so you go into town. We lived an hour out of St. John's, so which is the capital for those who don't know of Newfoundland. Um, small city, but beautiful. Anyway, so we get out there and uh, we got called to a call. I don't even know when this had happened, man. Doesn't matter. Anyway, middle of the winter sometime. Now, when you're out in Newfoundland, we're on call 24 hours. We get called for the craziest stuff. And we've been called to this house. She was a regular. We'll have to call her for confidentiality. Um, Stephanie. So we went to Stephanie's house, who was a regular in town. And we have to get, we get in for the call and uh, she drank too much. She said she had 30 beers or something. And she's like, I need to go to the hospital. I'm going to die. We, we saw her, what, twice that day? And then again, last week, typically and unfortunately, people will use the ambulance, especially if they're unemployed or on like provincial benefits, they will use it as a ride into town and then just walk out of the hospital. So you're basically a taxi. Really? Yeah. Something that's a huge bill though? Well, if they're not working, they're on unemployment or they're on like uh, either disability or what's what I'm looking for. There's another term for it, it, age or something else, right? They don't have to pay. The government pays for it. Mm, and so okay. this, what would be a $300 taxi ride and they don't have to pay for it. So okay. just get up, leave, and then walk back in and bum a ride from somebody or whatever else. So anyway, we got called over to Stephanie's house and she said, oh, I had 30 beer and I need to go to the hospital. I'm real sick and I'm, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And we're like, you're fine. And we talked her out of it. So sometimes you can talk, they decide like they don't want to go, they sign a, a paper. It's just like, yep, I don't need service anymore. I'm good. You can go back home. So I drove two blocks back to the house and whatever. She called back. Like, Fuck. Okay. So anyway, we go over, pick up Stephanie. This is the third call today for the same reason. We're like, fine, we're going to take you into the hospital. She was, she seemed perfectly fine to me. She seemed perfectly fine to my partner. And anyway, so we uh, got her over, we were driving in. It's about an hour drive to the hospital. And then she starts getting nauseous in the back seat. She's not feeling very good. We're like, how much did you drink? She's like, well, it was a couple of beers. So not 30? No, I'm like, great, because you'd be dead. That would kill her in yeah. right? <laughs> So anyway, she had a couple. She's getting a little bit nauseous in the back of the ambulance. And the difference between the ambulances in Newfoundland versus like a big inner city, the ones in rural, they're van ambulances. So it's a cargo van. Now, my buddy, he had size like 15 feet. He had to actually get his boots custom made from Thunder Bay and shipped in for $450 because his feet were too big to buy them at Mark's Work Warehouse. And so the ambulances were so narrow, he had to sit cross legged because the bench and the stretcher, his feet couldn't fit between them. So I'm driving. Each call we switch. So I'm attending and then he's attending. And so one will attend, one will drive. On this call, thank God I was driving. Now, in the back of the van ambulance, there's just one big tube. There's no windows back there. And so she's starting to get sick to her stomach. And so she pulls out these vomit bags. So it's a little it's a little paper valve. It's one way. And into the plastic bag, it fills about a liter of vomit. And she started getting sick. And so she starts to vomit. And so he, he comes up. There's a little window in the back between uh, the cab in the back where the patient is. And there's a little window. It's about 12 by 12 up to the front of the cab. And so he asked me to crack some window because she starts to vomit. And vomit stinks, especially when it's in a hot car or heated ambulance in the back of a closed cavity. And so I look at the back mirror and he's got his nose in his shirt and she's vomiting. And for whatever reason, she wouldn't hold the bag. He's holding this vomit bag for her. She fills the entire thing, one full liter. And so he tosses it into the garbage and grabs another. It's one way, thank God. But he grabs another. And he starts holding that. She's vomiting. And I hear her talking from the back. She stands up. He's like, sit down, Stephanie. Like, sit back down. Like, buckle in. You're supposed to be on the stretcher. She gets up. She's trying to shout at me through this 12 by 12 window. And I'm like, yeah, Stephanie, like, just whatever. When we get there, just stop talking to me. You're breathing vomit in my face. And I'm trying to drive a truck at nighttime in rural Newfoundland where there's more moose than people. Okay. We've almost hit many, many moose. And so... We finally get over to the hospital and I open up the back and it just, I open the door and it just wafts this Ugh. billow of vomit. And I look inside, there's vomit on the stretcher, on the floor, on the bench, it's in the garbage, just two bags. We <laughs> did a shit job of that and we have to clean it. So that was a disgusting mess. Anyway, she gets out of the back of the ambulance. She says, were you going to get it for me? I said, what? 
my teeth. I said, what do you mean? She lost her dentures in the one-way vomit bag. She said, you said you get them for me. I'm like, no, I did not agree to that. I'm not digging into your vomit bag. You, know, you said yes to when she was yelling. You yeah, I, I was just trying to get her to sit down, right? I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Apparently, I said yes to going into this vomit bag with a one-way valve and helping her find her dentures. Absolutely not going to happen. So she takes the garbage out of the ambulance, dumps it on the grass outside of the emergency room of the hospital. She opens this bag and she's going through finding her dentures, picks them up, pops it back oh, in her mouth. Oh my God. <laughs> and so she's got her hands covered in vomit. She's got fresh vomit <laughs> dentures in her mouth and she walks into the hospital. That's worse than children, right? Oh, that was probably that I've been, like I said, covered head to toe in blood. I've had human feces on my boots. That was the most disgusting ridiculous call I've ever got Why was she throwing up? Was it the alcohol? I don't know. She had a couple of beer and she was nauseous in the back of the truck. Jesus. Yeah. Was it your driving? <laughs> yeah, probably. Should have started swerving, make oh her puke God, more. I'm not going to be able to eat after this. Uh, <laughs> that's why I eat before I got here. Some people, I tell you. Yeah, there, there's some stuff, man. Some creative stories, like all kinds of wild stuff happens. Almost dropped a guy, strapped to a spine board in ice water in the middle of the winter. Um, that was his fault. Carbon monoxide poisoning. As we're passing them over on from a fishing boat to the dock, he started moving oh. around as he was coming to, right? Uh. Um, yeah, we had ATV rollovers. We had car crashes where like the, the, the guy's skull was collapsed and just pouring blood. All kinds of stuff has happened, but that that vomit and teeth was one of my shining moments in my career. <laughs> <laughs> I vividly, that's my trauma. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still working through that one. Speaking yeah. of regrets, it was showing oh, up to that call. Man. All right, well, we'll definitely have to do this again. Then I'll definitely hear more stories then. And we'll see how the uh, viewers take it. <laughs> <laughs> so, in there. You're going to lose again, followers from that story. All right. But once again, thanks so much for your time, uh, Josh. I really appreciate you coming. It's been a pleasure, and man. Like I said, we'll do this again. All right, man? Okay. Take care, everybody.